like jazz hands, Tim, like this to get warmed up. <laughs> I'm gonna take <laughs> right. a picture of this whole thing. Okay, cool. <laughs> Welcome back to the channel. I'm Hank Strange. We're live from the Big Daddy Gun Studios. Put on your big girl panties, because Tim Harmson from Military Arms Channel is in the building. We're gonna do this. We're going a little early. A little make early me sound today. so important, man. Yeah. Hank is great for making me feel important. <laughs> you are important. You're like, I, I look at you as like the godfather of gun guys on YouTube. You know what cracks really me do. up is Eric, an mm -hmm. Iraq veteran, said that to me the last time we were together. Right. I said, dude, how can you say that? <laughs> You're, I think, like, I think it's true. Twice my, my size and always has been, you know? Right. I mean, obviously, like, those guys are a powerhouse. You know, I'm not trying to take anything away from them. They're like a force to be reckoned with. But... You know, everyone does their own thing, right? Hickok does his thing, Iraq veteran does their thing, and, um, and there's, there's a bunch of people, I'm not trying to leave anyone out. But I look at you as like the godfather, just because of your whole approach and, and, and the way that you look at everything here. Sometimes, you know, you fight, with, uh, you fight with companies, maybe you fight with some people sometimes, but you do it all from the love of guns, right, in the Second yeah. Amendment. Oh, absolutely, and I, I do get into it with companies. But I don't try to, it's just my nature of, so, you know, what's kind of funny, I, I just had a fan in today at the shop and, and we were talking about all the various YouTubers and, and it always comes up like who's in whose pocket, right? Like, like yeah. who's being paid to say, <laughs> drink Starbucks coffee. <laughs> this episode brought to you by coffee in a bottle, you know, right. it, it, and which is kind of funny. And I'll try to go back to that and revisit it because it happened in a video of mine recently. Uh, but are you we're, talking we're, about, we're talking about that, that stuff and I won't mention any, any channel names, but uh -huh. oh, what the heck, I'll just say it. So, so he said, well, what do you think about about Don Such, and I said, Such is not like in every got every company's pocket. He's not. People believe that, and it cracks me up. He's just you doing Such. You would know. I think you know Don is just so wholesome. The, the way he approaches things is different than how I approach things. Like I look right. at something and I go, I wonder how I can break this. Right. And and he'll look at something and go, This is pretty neat. I wonder how it shoots. Right. So he's approaching it from a different way than I am. I'm looking for problems. Oh, I mean, it's just my nature. Like, even you in like the business break, you world, like I was kind of sitting in the room that was like trying to think of things that could possibly go wrong with a business plan, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's just my nature to, and inevitably, when you go looking for trouble, you find it. I break everything I touch. But yeah, I, you know, I think you know, like Such gives really good, honest reviews. Nothing fancy does. I mean. Yeah. All the big channels and all the small channels and everybody thinks that all these gun companies have a bazillion dollars and they're just sitting here go take, you know, <laughs> here, take some, take some. It's all, we got plenty. It's all for you guys. Yeah. And really guys, when it boils down to it, we're a bunch of YouTubers. We're guys with cameras and there's nothing behind the scenes other than guys with cameras. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's this not is, like this is the kind of thing or the discovery channel. We're just, yeah, it, they really don't take us seriously half the time. No, I, I listen. I think this is the kind of thing that you have to do for the love of it. Uh, you know, maybe not for the money of it. That's for sure. No, this is how I spend <laughs> money. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm good at that, man. I, I yeah. I, you know, I mean, try to keep Max self-supporting, where the revenue it brings in through AdSense and stuff, it just keeps it so it can keep moving on its own, where I don't have to put money into it like I did for the first six years. It was a channel, right? And um, I just want it to stand on its own, so I'm not taking money away from my family to keep it running. And everybody has it in their minds that YouTubers like my size or bigger even, they, they think that they're just getting filthy rich. And mm -hmm. we're well, not, you know, man. I we're, think that- have, I work seven know, days a week and I'm far from rich. Exactly, yeah, you're working all the time, man. You're, I don't know how the hell, that's the reason why you have to drink those uh, pink monster drinks. A monster energy drink. Special <laughs> sponsor, no don't you, channel. Don't <laughs> you, it would be awesome. Monster should sponsor you, my friend. Dude, that was so funny. So we were, this is one of the guns I brought out. He asked if I brought any, any firearms. So this yeah. is one of the SIG P320s I have. The one that I actually used in the test is at my house. I was taking pictures of it, but this is my second one. So when I did my, my follow-up video, it was so funny what started it. So I went on a prairie dog hunt when I posted the first thousand round test. And for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, I took a SIG P320 and fired 1,000 rounds of ammo through it in 13 minutes. Yeah, you had, and, you had minions. Are those minions in, uh, are they expensive out your way? <laughs> Minions, no, they're actually, they work at Copper Custom, which is a separate entity, and I gotta like beg my business partner to pull resources because they're on the clock at Copper, right? So, right, yeah, um, I, yeah. It was cool though. I liked it. I like how you were like tossing it down. <laughs> oh, well, the criticisms were, were were incredible. So right after I posted that video, 
you know, I started seeing comments like, you missed something, you missed something. There's clear, there's clear melting on the frame, which I just didn't see when I filmed the video. I guess it was hot and I was excited and, you know, the gun passed the test, in my opinion, and I was just having a good time and we wiped it down and we all looked at it real quick, loaded up some more magazines and fired a few more hundred rounds to see if the gun worked and it did. But anyway, so the comments started flowing in saying, you missed this, you missed this, you missed this. And even over on uh, ARFCOM, I had one guy say, I'll never trust Mac's opinion again. Clearly, he he's trying to talk about <laughs> the fact that the frame melted. And I said, whoa, 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 hot rod. <laughs> cool, <you're good. laughs> sure. So I'll go back. I'm not home right now. And if there is something there that I missed, I will tell everybody. And so I posted pictures on my patron page. And I asked my patrons, hey, this is what I found. I found some melted spots. What do you guys think? Does this warrant an update video or not? And they were split 50-50. So I did an update video. All right. Which brings me to this. This episode brought to you by Starbucks Coffee. And that's um, a special one. That's a preference. <laughs> <laughs> my wife just dropped these off. She went to Costco, right? Oh, nice. She's trying, she's trying to make me quit drink monster, drinking monsters because they're, I guess, rat poison or something. I don't know. But so then I did my update video where I talked about the parts that I had found that melted on the frame, which is a $35 part. And, and uh, so I made that update video. But it just so happened... I had a very, I have it now, a very dry, scratch, a scratchy throat. I don't know what it is. I don't know if I'm getting sick or if I just, you know, allergic to something. But I had a monster can sitting on the table next to me. It just so happened the monster <laughs> label was perfectly facing the camera as if it was placed there, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and it started happening. People started saying, oh, I thought you said you would never take a sponsorship, sell out, like ban. But yeah. it, it's like they were accusing me of being sponsored by monster. Like, if anybody was going to sponsor me that wouldn't damage the credibility of the channel and my opinions on firearms, I would gladly take mon money from Monster. If they buy me yeah. a my Jeep, buy a new Jeep and make it a Monster Jeep, I'd drive yeah. that thing probably around you, and put it in every video, but that's not how it works, guys. So, exactly. If you so were now getting, I'm going to start. What's that? I'm sorry, I was going to say, if you were getting Monster money, why would you hide that? <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? And what cracks me up, this is what's even more funny. So the, the Family Express, which is a chain of, of gas stations here in my area, uh, the guy that sells me the monsters in the morning is a fan of the channel. It took me like three months to realize that he, when he got hired there, mm -hmm. he was like overly nice to me. And then one day he goes, Hey man, what do you think I should use for a carry gun? I'm like, what? And, and <laughs> I said, well, I personally carry a CZ, you know, PO one compact. He goes, yeah, I know. I follow your channel. So for like three months, the guy hid it from me. Right. But he had been selling me these monsters since he started working there. Cause he sees me come in every morning and get one. It's my cup of coffee. Right. And, uh, and so I started laughing and I, and I said, did you see the comments in that last video? And he was laughing. He's like, yeah, man, I, you ought to put me on the channel basically to, uh, to tell everybody this is the guy you buy him from. Yeah, exactly. I, I bet you he wishes there was some money in it, you know, like a bonus. <laughs> yeah, man, I'd take a monster yeah. pickup truck or something. I'd drive it around and monster. But yeah, you know, then they'll people... find out 10 years from now it causes cancer and rats and then I'd feel really bad. So I, I can't. Yeah. My well, wife and everybody tells me to quit drinking it because it's like, I guess it's really bad for you. I don't know. But uh, you, everybody has a story. You shoot guns, so there's going to be lots of things that are going to go wrong. I mean, you, yeah, could go you're going to lose your herring. <laughs> well, even my, I think yeah. it was my father-in-law. Somebody said that they found, like, at the steel mills here, there's this guy that was like the, the very epitome of, of health, right? Big muscle-bound guy. And they found him dead in the cafeteria, and he had drank two monster drinks that morning, and his heart, he had a heart attack. Wow. And they blamed yeah. it on the monster, right? Yeah. The guy yeah. probably drank two monsters a day for life. But yeah. it was the monsters that caused his heart to give out on him, do I guess. You, are you into movies? It depends, man. I don't have time to watch them, but I, I do go see movies when I can, yeah. Okay, so have you ever seen Idiocracy? No. Okay, this, you got to watch this movie, man. Idiocracy, we are living this shit. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> it, it's, it's a really old movie. I think, has it been out 20 years at this point? Um, it, I think it was done by Mike Judd, the same guy that did. Uh, what's the cartoon that Mike Judd did? Um, I don't do cartoons, man. I'm too. Yeah, old it's that. it's one of it's one of these cartoons with uh, I, you know I don't really like the word redneck, but it's like a redneck cartoon. That's okay. I'm a redneck, and you can call me. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but it's it's basically a movie where there's a guy in, in the present day, and he gets him and a girl get frozen, and they go into the future. So what happens while they're frozen before they wake up in the future is all the smart people don't have babies. They do other shit and they don't have babies, right? And then the stupid people, a lot of uh, you know um, Britney Spears types, they just have babies like crazy. So in the future when he wakes up there, like everyone's stupid as hell. <laughs> and if you're smart, you know they think you're gay or you're evil or something like that, they hate you because you're smart. 
and um, they don't they don't use water anymore. They water the crops with an energy drink. I think it was called Brano or something. Someone will someone will uh, you know tell me what the right name is, but basically they're watering the crops with it. You know, and this is before. I'm sure if you go back to then, they didn't have monster energy drinks and all that kind of stuff back in those in right. that time. So, yeah, Not Mondo. The last movie I watched was the new Planet of the Apes movie. Talk oh, okay. about underwhelmed, man. I was like yawning the entire movie. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I have. It took like an it. hour to get to a gunfight scene. Oh, yeah. I haven't. I haven't go. I haven't gone to the movie. I don't really like. I like movies, but I don't like going to the movies. Oh, uh, you like pirating them, huh? Yeah, well, no, I just watch him on Netflix. <laughs> I watch him. You just admitted to breaking the law. <laughs> I, I watch it on Netflix. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, <laughs> I do like it. Netflix. I, yeah, I, I pay for it on, on iTunes. You know, I buy it. I've got Apple TV. That's all I'm admitting nice to. Nice save. Nice save. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But <laughs> but um, you you would like Idiocracy. I'm going to tell you. You're gonna, you would like it. Because we're living that shit. This is before like Obama got elected. Basically, the president in this movie is a rock star. It's played by this um, this really muscle bound black guy that he's he's in a lot of stuff now, but he's the guy that can bounce his packs and do all that kind of stuff. I think he was in the uh, Old Spice commercials and all that, but he's basically a rock star, and that's how he becomes president. Well, we're living that nowadays. Oh, I've heard about the movie now. Yeah, it's kind of a it's it's kind of a comedy, right? Yeah, it's kind of a comedy, but it was prophetic, man. We are okay. living this cool. shit. From, yeah, I, I I've heard of it now. I have to I have to watch it. Yeah. You become yeah. president? Is that what you said? Yeah. If you watch this movie, there's so many things that we are like back then when they made this movie, everyone thought it was a horrible movie and oh, this is crap. But if you look at it today, you'll think like, did these guys get in a time machine? <laughs> yeah. You know, and go forward and see like how we're because we're li like every single thing in that movie. We're living it. If you're intelligent now, people think you're stupid. You're boring. You know, yeah. All of that, all of that. When you try to make intelligent arguments and all that, they shoot you down. I, I live for the man on the street interviews you see on television. Mm -hmm. So who did America fight during the Civil War? Right? <laughs> yeah, who knows? Germany. <laughs> it, the response is absolutely hysterical. <laughs> ISIS. <laughs> I laugh at it while I'm almost crying because these people vote, man. And, yeah. and it's just, it, it is, it's mind numbing. And you know, our school systems are, are teaching revisionist history. They don't teach the truth. They don't talk about the bad things that we've done. And we have to talk about them because I've gone out and learned. I mean, America, I love this country more than anything. I don't necessarily mm -hmm. agree with my government, but my country, I would give my life in a second for my country. Right. But my government is a completely different story. And, and our government has done some really messed up stuff throughout the years. And they don't teach that. You have to go and learn it. So everybody just thinks that we're this white knight in the in the in the world, and we don't ever do anything wrong, and we never hurt anybody or do things to our own, you know, for our own selfish reasons. But man, there's a lot of stuff out there that that, that we've done. But yeah, yeah, and don't and we shouldn't be, um, you know, we shouldn't be dogmatic to anything, right? No, I see. That's why I don't consider myself a Democrat or Republican, man. I'm 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 independent, and I think of myself more as a constitutionalist. I. I don't think that, you know, you take a look at what we've done to, to our country. We went from autonomous states to an all-powerful central government, something our founding fathers told us explicitly not to do. Mm -hmm. And we did it. didn't even take 100 years. Uh, you know, we, we've, we've gone from states' rights and individual liberties to what can the government do for me now? We have right. the federal government funding the highway system. We have the federal government controlling schools. We have the federal government controlling just about everything. They tax us into oblivion. And we went to war with England over a 2% tax. And now we pay 60% of our revenue and our income in taxes, right. and we just sit there and take it. Yeah. Uh, uh, hold on one second. Yeah, I'm on air. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, the Big Daddy and the Big Daddy Guns. Oh, he's yeah? Just, uh, the big, yeah the he's, big Daddy's talking? Yeah, he's in the uh, he's, he's in like, the what's studio this here. Thing? Yeah. I was going to show you. You want to come and be on air for a second? Come on, Tony. Here. I'll, I'll introduce you to Mac from Military Arms Channel. He's a big, he's a, oh, you know, nice. he's a huge gun guy, Max. So this is, uh, this is Tim Harmson from Military Arms Channel. Here, just come Tim, in. Tim, nice to meet you. Yeah, here hey, you go. Hey, nice to meet you, man. Come, come down a little lower. There you go. There we go. So this is Big Daddy. <laughs> hey, Big Daddy. A.K.A. Tony. <laughs> that's happening. <laughs> so, so you're the, you're the, the guy that's nice enough to give Hank a place to do all this fun stuff, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Very generous. Very generous. And look, this is why he was coming oh. in here. This is what I wanted to surprise you with. It's Matt. a Calico nine millimeter, man. I have yeah. one of those. 
I know, I know you. If you have. watched my videos, you would have known I did a video on it. Is that a new one or an original? No, this uh, I don't know. This is a pretty old one that came in the store. We did watch your video. That's why I brought it in because I was telling Tony about it. It's used. I don't know how new it is. Oh, That's cool. The hundred round drum magazines are very desirable, man. Yeah, we we watched your video on this, and that's how. And then so he wanted to see it. Think it's worth buying? Uh, oh hell, yeah. he wants I to know if you think it's worth it buying right now. <laughs> huh? What do you think it's worth, Mac? You know what, man? You have to get on Gun Broker and check prices, man. That's how I determine on on collectibles are no longer made. Keep in mind that they're in business and they're still making them, and you can get parts and guns and stuff. So that kind of detracts from the collector's value. Those hundred round drum magazines, though, those are pretty desirable. Yeah, see, he could tell this is a hundred round magazine. I don't. That's how. Right, that's how buy. good Mac is. So, so this is definitely a buy, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a cool gun, man. I mean, yeah. they're not exceptionally reliable or anything, but they're historic, man. If you go back to '80s movies. They use those in prop houses and stuff because they look space age. Yeah. So a lot of old classic know, 80s movies. We, how do we find out like what age it is? Can we look at the serial number? Look at the serial number. Yeah. No. Yeah, Calico's still in business, man. You can call them up and they'll tell you if it's a new one or an old one. Oh, okay. Old yeah. More, more. Sweet. Yeah. So there you go. Right, you, know, we'll just, you heard it from Mac. All right, man. That's I'll, all you need. I'm tell my guy to get it. <laughs> yeah. <there you> go. <laughs> it's nice meeting you. I'll let you guys know. Nice meeting you. It's going to be a fight over who gets the gun. <laughs> I can tell you that. Because when I saw it, I was like, wait a second, I'm, I'm buying that gun from you guys. And, then, <laughs> and so one of the guys- If it's an original, man, buy it for 500. That's not a bad deal for an original. Well, so our gunsmith is a Marine and he was like, dude, you're not buying that gun. I'm buying that gun. <laughs> <laughs> dude, all the weird 80s guns. I should have I brought out some of my weird 80s guns. I've not even done videos on. Yeah. Some of them are pretty funny, man. The Nighthawk well, Arbeen is probably the funniest. I still have the original box and they give away in the 80s. It's really popular to wear these really stupid, big, gaudy belts. Right. <laughs> belt buckles. And it has this belt buckle that says Nighthawk on it. it and it came in the box with the gun. It, it's so yeah. bad. Yeah, man. That's You know what? Uh, one of these days, I, I want to come visit you. <laughs> when I come visit you, I just want to go through your guns. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people want to do that. They, they say, will I ever post a video of all my guns? I And, and the answer to that is no. I'll do them one at a time. But yeah, yeah it's... I've been collecting the darn things for 30 years, man. You wonder how you get so many guns. It's do you like, have guns that you've like forgotten that you have? Pretty much every day. Dude, I've almost bought guns on Gun Broker because I thought, oh, I got to have that for my collection. And then I go and I look in my safe. I'm like, oh, yeah, I bought one 10 years ago. <laughs> I mean, that's how bad it is. So, but get a second one. Get a, I, mean, I did. I've done it, man. I've actually done it. I've bought, I've bought guns I've already had. And I'm, I'm like really bad about, um, I love like, Military guns, obviously, and I like Second World War guns. So anything right. German, French, Japanese, um, you know, U.S. even of the big belligerent countries that were in the war, I like to, to collect their firearms. Right. And so the Germans, man, they used more handguns to try to have a complete collection of German handguns from Second World War is almost impossible because they use so many different ty of types of guns. They would roll into a country and then just take over all their arms production and then push it into police or military service. And there's just so many guns out there. I even found, I found a 1935A uh, Nazi marked French, it shoots a, a proprietary nine by 20 cartridge that has the little German proof mark on it. Wow. I mean, they just, they just, they adopted everything in yeah. oddball calibers. But, so yeah. where, where so. are you getting those from? Are all those, are those coming from overseas or? No, most of them are what I call, and, and I, I, I call them um, duffel bag guns. Mm -hmm. I finally nicked my wedding ring. My wife is going to kill me. I wondered what that was. Man, I must have hit something really hard. I've wore this ring for like so many years. Oh, and is it titanium? It seemed like it was indestructible, but I, I put a big gash in it. Oh, wow. I must have yeah. shut my hand in the door. My, my ring saved me. That's what I'll tell her. I make oh. up a story. Yeah, but, tell her that's good luck. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, oh, my, but honey, it saved my life. But yeah. um, at least it didn't happen next to the, yeah, anyway. So um, I call them duffel bag guns, and I like to get the guns that don't have import marks on them. That means a soldier brought them back, so that gun has a story to tell. Right. And so probably 90% of my World War II and World War I even collection of firearms are duffel bag guns. They have no... Century Arms import marks, and who are some of the others? Um, there, there are a number of imports. Century is by far the largest importer and has been for many years. But they'll have, they have to put markings on them when they bring them in, and I want them without the markings. I want to know a soldier brought that home in a duffel bag. So Yeah. I mean, it's cool that we used to do that. I don't know. When did they stop doing that? In Vietnam or probably after Vietnam, right? So Vietnam soldiers were bringing guns back. Machine guns 
were very, very hard to get back. Uh, a lot of soldiers brought them home anyway. And then they had an amnesty. A lot of folks don't know that, but the NFA had an amnesty after the, uh, after the uh, Vietnam War. And I've actually seen an amnesty, uh, Viet Cong AK-47, a buddy of mine owned it. He, he passed away, but um, he had it hanging and had prominently in his gun room and it had to bring back papers. And then, um, which is basically the letter that the soldier wrote that, you know, told how the, how the gun was captured and stuff. It wasn't the bring back papers. It was a letter of Providence. And then it was an amnesty gun. So it was, it was, yeah added to the NFA under an amnesty. They've only done a few of them since 1934 when they enacted that BS law. So what happens after, unfortunately, he passed? What happens then? Uh, well, with, with machine guns and stuff like that, uh, he was a, a dealer. And so anybody that has their name on the license can just take over. His wife may have had her name on the license. I'm not sure. Uh, but with, with NFA items, you have a grandfather, I mean, your, your grandfather, but you have a grace period where you have to notify ATF. It's a taxless transfer, but then you transfer the ownership of those firearms and, and anything else into the possession of another family member if they're on, you know, on, on like form fours to an individual and not in a trust. That's why I always tell people to get a trust because it makes it so much easier. Right. When I die, all my guns that are NFA items will transfer seamlessly to my wife or from her to my children. And I don't have to file any paperwork. I don't have to figure it all out or I'd be dead, but they don't have to figure it all out. Yeah. Uh, that's just the easiest way to deal with those types of things, those heavily yeah. regulated items. Right. That's the route that we went. Now, I know they changed the rules a little bit. So now if you add things, I think everyone on the trust has to go through all the paperwork, right? Yeah, that's that's the 41F nonsense. Um, mm -hmm. Gee, I thought we had a gun-friendly president in the White House. Why hasn't he undone <laughs> yeah. some of this stuff? <laughs> yeah, I kept yeah. hearing about how Trump's a big, you know, big gun guy. I know Donald Jr. is, but, you know, I, I, I waited through the first 100 days. Yeah. And, you know, he's doing all this crazy stuff the first 100 days. I thought, okay, let's see what he does with firearms. Surely on his agenda is one, one firearms item. Not a single thing. Not a peep out of him on firearms since he took office. I can't. Yeah, I think there's still a lot of people out there that have faith. I mean, I think we just passed the six-month mark. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to say that, that um, you know, it's not going to happen. But I don't think personally it looks very likely, right? It's, there's a lot of guys waiting for suppressors to come off the NFA, all that kind of stuff. I mean, what do you think the chances are of that? I think the Hearing Protection Act was a farce. And I think the, the entities behind it uh, did it as a PR stunt and it backfired. And it's pretty much put one of them out of business. Uh, it, it was, if you read the original bill, now they have the Shush Act, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't read it, but the original HPA was was the most ridiculously poorly written bill I have ever read in my entire life. And you can read it in about 20 seconds. It's half a page. And right away, I looked at it and I said, there's a major hole in this law. Okay. And, the fa and at that hole in the original act was that it made no mention of the Gun Control Act of 1968. In the Gun Control Act of 1968, there are 14 separate references to silencers and how they're regulated. The Hearing Protection Act didn't deal with that whatsoever, made no mention of it, didn't deal with it. So let's say it passed in its, in its, in its current form. That means because under the Gun Control Act of 1968, every single component of a suppressor, is, every part is considered a suppressor in and of itself. A baffle, for example, if you have, which those boundaries are being pushed now with people with these erector cans like Q and stuff are doing. Right. But historically, the ATF has considered things like baffles to be suppressor parts. So mm -hmm. I can't, get a baffle strike, call up, you know, Griffin Armament and say, hey guys, I, I dinged one of my baffles. Can you send me another one? You have to send the, the silencer to the manufacturer. They can replace the part and send it back to you. Those parts are regulated, even though they're not serialized, which makes no sense. Yeah, is this the same thing with the wipes, right? What's that? Don't we have that same problem with the wipes? Yeah, same thing with the wipes, right? So the, the ATF just selectively enforces things, right? So, um, but back to the Hearing Protection Act, if that passed its current form, then every single part of the silencer would have to be serialized. And when you went to buy a silencer, let's say it had 14 parts in it, you would have to do 14 4473 forms on every oh. single serialized part because every part that the ATF considers to be a silencer would have to have a serial number and therefore you'd have to do paperwork on it. Right. It, it was it was a horribly piece, a horribly written piece of legislation. It was done purely as a publicity stunt and it backfired. It got everybody all excited. It had 0% chance of passing. And um, it looks like they're trying to fix it. I, I don't know what the Shush Act is all about. I, I have to go read it. 
but the HPA hopefully dies because it has a, no chance of passing. And um, those that, that brought it up and, and then publicized it should be spanked, flogged, public flogging. Yeah, you know, that's that's the reason why I referred to you earlier as like the godfather of this. You think about things because you're so into this and you look at it so deeply. You think about things that the rest of us don't think about. Um, I never really thought of that. I know that it's effectively killed the uh, suppressor market. It did. It wiped it out. Everybody that comes in our store looks at silencers and goes, I'm just going to wait for the HPA to pass. Yeah. And you can't say it's never going to happen to them because you just look like a salesman. You're like, yeah, yeah. go ahead and wait, you know. Yeah. I mean, look, can we get, can we do anything with healthcare? Oh man. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. the government. First of all, they just need to repeal the NFA, right? Regulating short barreled rifles and silencers and machine guns is, is dumb. Um, and, and the law, the original law itself is flawed because they intent, they wrote it with the intent of including handguns, but at the last minute they pulled handguns out of it because they knew they wouldn't get the votes. So handguns were left to be left unregulated, but short barreled rifles, doesn't make sense. Or regulated. So let me understand this. I can take a handgun and I can hide this in my waistband. It's small enough to be hidden and carried around where nobody knows I have it. But their justification for banning a rifle with a 10 inch barrel and a, and a, and a collapsible stock, which is two or three times larger than that, is that it's too small and concealable and needs to be regulated. Yes. I mean, where's the logic in that? But that's, that's my argument with gun control laws in general. None of them make any sense. And they're all driven for different reasons. I mean, I remember back during the Clinton era, we had um, President Clinton pushing to, to destroy the fire ring of, of gun manufacturers, the Jennings and the Jimenez and, and all these companies that were making $100 handguns. And I, and I thought about that and I said, you know what, that's just pure racism. Because Hell what yes. they're trying to do is they're trying to deny a certain class of people the ability to buy a gun to defend their lives with, right? Yes. Yes. And, and the, the, it's, it's, it's like the machine gun game now is a rich man's sport. People are fine with the fact that somebody that's a millionaire can buy a machine gun. That's okay. You're rich. You're to be trusted with it. But me, the blue collar guy, I can't own one because it costs as much as a freaking car now. And right. basically, I mean, the $200 tax is a joke. It's the $25,000 for the M16 I can't afford. Right. You know, but but they've but that should be unconstitutional. It's Ill, it should be illegal for them to do that because basically it just creates a gap, and you know the people of modest means are separated from the people of of great means, and they can have their rights, but we can. And that's you know it, people say, what, what do you think of the high point carbines and the high point pistols? I think they're awesome because it gives a whole class of folks that can't afford a Glock or a CZ or an H and K the ability to buy a gun that fits their budget that they can defend themselves with because every single person in this country deserves the right to uh, keep and bear arms. But anyway, yeah. I get off that no, rant. No, 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 you're yeah, absolutely, you're 100% right, man. I mean, this is, you know, when, when uh, we, I had this conversation yesterday uh, on a hangout we had yesterday that if you're saying you're a gun guy, but you don't, you know, you don't think this gun deserves to exist, I think you have the right to say what you like, what you don't like. But all these guns should be here. You can't say I don't like. It's like saying you're a car guy, but you don't like this car or that car. Oh, I know. You know? Or you, you like, like you like goat. women, but I don't like this. I don't like skinny ones or this one. You know, I mean, come on. It it gets my goat, man, because I'm I'm an old fart, right? Maybe that's why everybody makes fun of me. You know, Eric's a young guy. You're a young guy. I'm almost fifty. I turned forty nine here real soon. <laughs> okay, hold on. First of all, I'm not a young guy. I'm forty five years old. Um, and uh, <laughs> okay, because you're and like I, two I years older. <laughs> And I remember when machine guns were just commonplace, man. They they right. they were in every gun store. Uh, they 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 you know back in those days, you fill out your your form four, you would have it back literally in four weeks. You could you know there wasn't a year waiting time. An M16 and an AR15, the only real difference in price was the two hundred dollar tax, and they were just everywhere. Anybody could buy them, and and they were you know there just wasn't the, the bar for entry into that that particular line of ownership was fairly low. Fast forward to today, after 1986, after they banned all those machine guns, the new production of machine guns, and now I make a post on Instagram saying repeal the NFA, and I have gun people, people that were born in the 80s and 90s, I have gun people saying, what do you need a machine gun for? There'll be running what? gun no, battles in the streets, there'll be blood everywhere. Those are not gun guys. I lived through the era when they were legally, well, they were easily obtainable, and guess what? It never made the news, matter of fact, there was only up until the, the ban happened in 
1986, I think there was only one, maybe two instances where legally owned machine gun was used in a crime. And ironically, one of those instances was an off-duty police officer using a MAC-10 to kill the guy that was screwing his wife. So that's, like, that's totally fine by me. <laughs> right, right. I don't even think that's a crime. But no, I would use a freaking tank. <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd get, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd use uh, a baseball bat with barbed wire around it. Yes. Anyway. Yeah, um, um, pineapple comes to mind, <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, you know, that's true, man. It's insane. I don't think those guys were gun guys though, Mac. I think they are. They're, they're just current generation gun guys, right? So it, it's no different than the argument back when Florida was one of the first states 20 some years ago, the crime in Florida was just getting so out of hand that their state legislature decided to do something that they deemed to be crazy. And they said, you know what, let's just give guns to everybody. And they did a shall issue state. They, they created mm -hmm. the permit system and gave everybody a gun. All you had to do was prove that you weren't a felon. And it was a right. shall issue. They could not deny you a gun for political reasons, for eco uh, economic or social reasons. They could, had to give you a gun unless they could prove a reason why you weren't able to own one. And that was a radical way of thinking. Now, my state of Indiana, we've had gun permits since 1934, so it was nothing new. But there were so few states that had actually, there were actually shall issue back then. Florida made the national news when they did it. But guess what? Crime plummeted in Florida year yeah. after year after year. And when the other state legislatures took note, like, oh, my gosh, there aren't running gun battles in the streets. The same argument that the millennials have now against machine guns. There aren't running gun battles in the streets. The other state legislature said, hey, man, if we want to lower crime in our state, let's let's do what Florida did. And one by one by one by one, they fell to now we have all 50 states with concealed carry licenses of some sort. Some may issue, some shall issue. But even Illinois was drug kicking and screaming into the 21st century uh, through the federal court system. And now they're concealed carry. So, I mean, I this, mean yeah. this begs the question, Mac. Um, you know, because I, I agree with you. I don't think we can, I don't rely on politicians to do any, I don't rely on anyone to do anything, right? I mean, it's a philosophy that I think a lot of us live by. So yeah. what do we do now that we're here? How, how, well, how do we deal with this stuff? You know, we can complain about it, but how do we actually do something, fix things, make things better going forward? Well, we can. We, we, we certainly can. There are things that we can do, and I'll talk about one of those things, which is something I talk about on my channel now that I never used to. But first, we have to overcome the apathy that, that takes over whenever somebody of a particular party, uh, their, their candidate gets elected and they win the White House. That, the, that party becomes apathetic. They think, oh, we got our guy in office. Now we just sit back and coast for four or eight years, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's what's going to happen to it. That's what's happening with American gun owners. Trump won. No more threat. I mean, we just had a, a public shooting and it just gets a blip on the news. Trump doesn't discuss it. No threats of new legislation. You know, everybody moves on. Everybody now is apathetic. They're like, ah, we got four well, the, years, the, man. The, the, uh, the joke. No, now is the time you start fighting. Now that we have the advantage in the White House, so we think the House and the Senate, now is the time we go on the offense. We get up off our lazy butts. We get out of our, our, our barca loungers. We put our beers down and we start doing something to get these laws undone. And it's fighting that apathy that is going to be the biggest challenge. And so, a couple of things have happened. So I've been one of the staunchest critics of the NRA since I was in my, my 20s, my early 20s. The NRA continuously aggravated me. I felt they, they weren't doing enough. And I was, I was very much against the NRA. I said, and I did, I joined Gun Owners of America. I joined SAF, I joined JAFO. I joined every other organization but the NRA because they kept making me mad. They fought Heller when Heller was, was uh, going, getting ready to go before the Supreme Court. They, they spent untold hundreds of thousands of dollars preventing that from being heard by the, by the Supreme Court. And then at the last minute, when they realized the court was going to hear it, they jump in with their lawyers. They jump in. It wins. They claim victory. They being the NRA. And, and it just made me so angry, right? Right. Mm -hmm. But then I was having a conversation with Pete Brownell of brownells.com fame. And, and Pete knew that I was a very vocal critic of the NRA. And he approached me and we did, we sat down one morning and had coffee at the thousand man shoot. And, um, and you were there. Yeah. Not the meeting, but you were at that event. Mm -hmm. And and so we chatted for about an hour. And at that time it was a secret, but it was, it was assumed that Pete would probably become the next president of the NRA. And he told me that, and I can talk about it now because he already is. And this is all right. You know, yeah. history. history. Yeah. yeah. So we talked about that. 
And he said, look, Tim, and he was sitting there. You met Pete. Pete is the most casual guy. I mean, he is, he is he's a, really he's humble. A, I could, he's really humble. I could tell he you. Is. At he the, is one of us. Yeah, at the show, um, and this was like my first time, I probably met him and didn't even realize who I was talking to. But exactly. <laughs> yeah, I met him he at the end. right in, man. He looks like a regular Joe. He doesn't have, you know, gold rings on every finger and, you know, wearing yeah. Armani suit. That's not Pete. Yeah. But the way how, like, my, my quick story on this, and then I'll let you get back to your thing, is that we were at the show and someone wanted to take a picture and he just happened to be walking by. And he stopped and he was taking pictures of people. And I was like, do these people understand this is like brown L's right here <laughs> taking pictures, you know, and he was, he was really cool. He took the pictures. He was like, Hey, you know, is that good? And, and then he was out of there and I was like, wow, that guy's, he's a, he's a real dude. He is, he is, he is a very good dude. And here's, and here's what I learned about him is that he thinks like I do now, unfortunately in, in, in the gun community, I'm, I'm a bit of a radical because I think all gun laws are illegal or are illegal. And people have even asked me, well, what about background checks? Illegal. If you yeah. don't like the way the Second Amendment is written, then get enough votes to, to erase it. They won't. They'll cause a revolution if you do. But all gun laws are illegal. Yeah, are CC, illegal. like the fact I that you have to have a license is bullshit. You know? Right. I mean, shall not be infringed. I don't care what English class you took. I don't care what interpretation of that that sentence that is the Second Amendment, it, how you determine to read it. There is no ambiguity if you look you know people watching right now bring up a separate browser window and, and google definition of infringe or infringement right. it means not one iota not even the slightest encroachment nothing Zip. yeah yeah nothing. infringement right. that means right. creeping right. upon right so <laughs> if you pass any type of anti-gun law that would regulate access of american citizens to firearms it is unconstitutional but yet we have thousands of laws on the books licensing schemes, which, you know, I'm happy. I mean, it's pretty bad when, when you get happy that your government says, here, you can have something that's your God-given right, right? Here you go, pay, you know, 85 bucks and we'll give you a lifetime license. Thank you, Mr. Government. Thank you. You know, we've become so conditioned to thank our government for giving us what is already ours. And, and oh, I get so wound up. So I'm on the fringe of the gun ownership, right? I don't care what it is. You should be able to buy it. If you don't like it, change, change the constitution if you think you can. Yeah, you're not but, alone, though, man. There's a lot of us that agree with you, 100%. And, but there's you know? but people say, well, reasonable restrictions, like Scalia's interpretation in the Heller, you know, when he wrote the, 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 uh, his opinion, you know, he even said reasonable restrictions. So it just left the door wide open for more people to make more challenges to the Second Amendment, because what is a reasonable restriction? There's no such thing as a reasonable restriction. That's nebulous. Yeah, but anyway, so uh, Pete and I were having, having a, a conversation about that, and Pete thinks just like I do. But he's also pragmatic in the sense that he knows that nobody's going to walk into the, the presidency of the NRA and nobody's going to walk into the presidency of the United States and just go, boom, all these gun laws are gone. Right. Have at it, everybody. It's yeah. not practical. It doesn't work that way. It takes years of commitment and constantly fighting those small battles here and there to win the war. And it's it's you have to have a long-term goal. You can't fight right here in front of you. you can't, be stuck with what's in front of your nose. You got to look down the road. Mm -hmm. And Pete is that man. And he convinced me of it. And I said, you know, Pete, if, if everything you're telling me is true, I will become an advocate of the NRA. I will become a life member and I will actively recruit for the NRA. And he said, all right, deal. <laughs> and so, and, and everything that he had said to me, he became the president and everything else that we discussed started to happen. And I went to the NRA convention in Atlanta, and the first thing I did is I walked up and paid for my life membership, and I sent the text to Pete, and I said, here you go, man, I kept my promise, and he laughed, and we had some meetings at, at, the, uh, at the NRA show. I was at the president's reception, and me and some of the other uh, YouTube guys got to sit right. around and, and chat with Pete, and, and NRA is really, people, myself included, I want to see immediate results, right? I want Pete to step in and make sweeping changes, and I want just magically all these gun laws have disappeared, but that's not the reality of the situation. And so I see a lot of folks when I say join the NRA, they still talk about what they've done in the past mm -hmm. under past administrations, 
Mm -hmm. they, they, they say, well, how did, how did the State Department thing happen with the VEPRs? NRA let that happen. NRA had no idea that was even going to happen. That's State Department. Those people were appointed by Obama. That hasn't been cleaned up yet. Yeah, Trump, yeah those, those like, fuckers are still in there. <laughs> right, they're still there causing problems. Those people are causing problems in the yeah. CIA. Still, so you got to clean house and get rid of all of them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I would blame Trump on that one over the NRA. So all these people want to blame the NRA, and I was one of them. But now I have a different opinion. I spent time with Pete Brownell. I met Wayne LaPierre, a man I used to have a very, very low opinion of. I had at least 20 minutes of chatting with him. I'm firmly convinced the man does firmly believe in our Second Amendment rights. I got to see behind the scenes and all the community outreach programs they just don't even talk about. Mm -hmm. I, I got to see that behind the curtain, so to speak, at NRA, and I thought, man, I have been wrong in the past, I'm wrong now, and now that Pete's in charge, I gotta back him. And, and this is, you know, and Yankee Marshall is a friend of mine, but we disagree on this point. He made a video recently saying that, have you noticed their shift in some of the YouTube channels where they're all of a sudden they were against the NRA, now they're for them, and the NRA is paying them to say they like the NRA? Absolutely 100% patently false. The NRA does not pay one single soul on YouTube to say, I support the NRA. Yeah, I mean, now, that's something that's something that we have to unpack. Just just like, I'm not trying to stop you because I think you're on a, a pretty good war path here. We have to, <laughs> I get we wound have to, up, brother. I get wound up. No, but we have to unpack it a little bit because I think that people did see the stuff with you and, and, La, and uh, LaPierre and all that and, and other guys, I think uh, Iraq veteran um, and Hickok 45. And so people think, oh, so they met, they met, you know, with the, with the big bosses over there and then got paid off. And now they're saying these guys are awesome. And, um, you know, you're, you're saying that, no, that's not what happened. Right. So NRA made no offers of money to us. So what a separate department, Pete and, and the board never made it, extended any type of monetary offers to any of us. All they wanted was our opinion because for the first time the NRA was coming out of its shell because they've so closely protected their brand and their image, they never let anybody talk about NRA business that isn't inside NRA. Right. Like, they tried to reach the social world through Mr. Colin Noir, and their approach was, okay, let's bring him in, make him a corporate man, give him a paycheck, give him a studio, and in my opinion and many other gun owners' opinions, he lost his voice when that happened. He became a corporate sport, a spokesperson. Yeah, went because from the independent you, but, YouTuber to the corporate sp spokesperson. Right, and also like what a lot of people don't know behind the scenes. I'm I'm sorry for interrupting you again, but I remember when I went to my first shot show probably like four or five years ago, and there there were um, there was this big meeting, and I obviously I didn't go to the meeting, but I was talking to one of the gun writers about this meeting with the NRA, and I asked him what was that meeting all about, and he said it was about you guys, about YouTubers. Yeah, and I was like, S what 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 was what about YouTubers? And he said, well, they wanted to know how to control you guys. Yep. Well, that I don't, I was, and, not and, then the, and then the, and then the colon noir thing happened. And that's how that, that's how that kind of, you know, becomes a bad situation, right? Yeah. And we just insert our own information about what went Yeah. You fill in the blanks. Right? It's kind of like what I did with Wayne LaPierre. All I saw yeah. was what was making it out into print. And I saw his actions and I, I found fault with them, but I never, I never met the man. And I yeah. came to hate a man I'd never met, and you never yeah. should do that. Yeah, perception, and, you know, is not necessarily reality, but that's right. what we live through as human beings. And even with Colin Noir, I mean, he's a genuinely good guy. I think, yes, you There's know. nothing they, wrong with him. He's an absolutely great guy. Yeah, and he does, like, I know, I mean, even I myself have pushed back against the NRA. Like, you know, there's some things that have happened. Um, you know, this, uh, this police officer that got off um, from shooting uh Philando Castile and all that kind of stuff people get upset and they're like where's the NRA when when the, what's what's going on is that there were several people at the NRA that were speaking out especially and including Colin Noir you know it's just that the NRA themselves didn't come out and make a statement on that I and and I kind of understand why they wouldn't in in some yeah. cases I don't know. I wasn't present at that meeting where, where they were supposedly trying to figure out a way to rein in YouTubers. Mm -hmm. I think NRA struggled as many companies do. Right. And I won't mention any names, but I, I you know, there, there was a company out there, a spokesperson for a company called me up one day and said, Tim, how the hell do I get a rein on these, these YouTubers? They're just you know, going crazy <laughs> out there. And I said, there is no way to get a rein yeah, on Don't us. do it. We say what we want. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and so, and, and once that's a really hard concept for people at my age, I hate saying that, or older, they, they're so used to the print and broadcast media being for sale that they can't grasp the concept that going back to how we, we started this video of just a guy in a camera in a room in nowhere, Indiana, 
mm -hmm. can say something and affect so many different people. And then you take it collectively. When that guy in Indiana meets with a guy like you in Florida and another guy in South Carolina and another guy, and we come together and we lend our voices to a cause, we can smoke the biggest broadcast network out there in terms of reach. We Absolutely. can reach more people because our audiences trust us. That's why they're our audience. They trust us in what we say. And when we join forces, they're scared of us because if you take a look at what happened with the Bundy Ranch, which ultimately turned out to be a big debacle, but mm -hmm. you know, when, when it first started and the federal government was going down there to you know, take away the cattle and, and put Bundy in jail, it was social media that stopped that. It, the, right. the call went out that fast. You had patriots from all parts of the country driving down to, to Nevada. Yeah, people showing up. <laughs> What's that, right? The balloon went up, social media. And that, yeah. that was a wake-up call for our government and for a lot of people in, 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 in traditional media. They saw what could happen. And that was still kind of a minor thing. I mean, we kind of touched upon it. We kind of all talked about it. We didn't all just say, you've got to go do this right now. And if we did that, if every one of us said, if we all came together, let's say the top 100 gun YouTubers came together and said, we're going to push a message that says we're marching on Washington tomorrow. And, right. and, and we could we could raise a 30,000 man or more army that fast. Our government's yeah. starting to take notice of that. Yeah. And I think um, this kind of like um, I hate to go off on another tangent because we're talking about some really good stuff here. But this kind of raises the question of us needing our own platform. Right. Because this is how we organize. This is how we get together. We're, you know, we really need to get to that level where we have our own platform and we're able to communicate and talk to each other without the Facebooks and the YouTubes and, and everyone else getting in the middle of that. Yeah, I mean, and that's that's the power of, of, of social media. And then, and then the kind of segueing back into the NRA discussion. So I wasn't privy to that meeting where they were supposedly trying to figure out a way to get a rain on, on YouTubers. Right. But I came in after that, the first exposure I had with NRA where they reached out to me and it was Pete himself was at Thousand, thousand Man Shoot. And then we, we've stayed in regular communication all the way up until the last NRA show. Now, those of us that met with Pete and some of the board members, the conversation was, how can we help you guys? When, when the YouTube demonetization happened, I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about this, but I'm, I'm gonna put it out there. When the YouTube demonetization happened, and, and it, at first we all thought it was just gun channels, but it wound up right. being pretty much everybody. Everyone. But when the news went out, gun, gun channels are being demonetized. We got a phone call from Pete Brownell and his staff saying, Tim, do we need to have a call? What should NRA's position be on this? I mean, do we need to help out? What can we do to help you guys? That phone call a year ago never would have happened. And so, it's little things like that that make that tells me the NRA is not pulling my chain when they say they care and they want to know what the people think through us. Right. And and so I, I mean, folks like you and I, we're a touch point to the firearms community that they don't have. No print magazine yeah, has. No but broadcast. so how, and how are they? How are they changing? I mean, because you've got guys like Pete Brownell that's infiltrating. I know that might sound like a bad word, but that's what we need to do. You know, we were trying to get Adam Kraut to to mm -hmm. get in there, right? And we're and and we're we'll not done with that. We'll get him next year. Yep. Yeah, we're not done with that. So I think that's the way that you do it. You know, you want to change something, you get in there. If you really believe in this and you have it in your heart like you, and that's really what I'm leading up to here, like what can we all do? I'm not saying everyone has to go out there and become a politician right. and campaign no, that, for things. You know, gosh, everyone has their tangents, position. Man. Don't huh? we? We get off on tangents, don't we? So yeah. <laughs> back to your point. So what can we do? Well, one of the things I think I believe very strongly at this point is that we need to join the NRA. And the NRA is, is definitely, I'm going to give them four years. And I've said this publicly many times. If anybody NRA watches this, this broadcast, I'm giving you four years. Maybe okay, eight, the depends countdown on how long we have a friendly administration, right? Mm -hmm. Got four years to do something. And even if we don't win the battles, I want to see the battles being fought. Got four years. If I go four years and NRA's done nothing and I haven't seen any battles being fought, either won or lost, I'm going to resign my life membership. I'm going to go right back to being their critic. But we got to stop being divisive. If, if, if four years from now, we don't have any more of our rights back, and I love Yankee to death. He's a friend of mine. But we have nobody to blame but ourselves, and we have people like Yankee Marshall that's keeping this division going and won't just say, all right, enough's enough. Let's just put our differences aside for four years, and let's see what we can do. And going out there and, and ruffling feathers and getting people angry and making battle lines within our own community. If, right. if we could just put aside all those differences for four years, guys, that was eight, four years, put them aside. 
and let's see what we can do. And if at the end of four years, nothing, shame on me. I'll take yeah. my public scorning. I'll even go to some public event and let you throw tomato, tomatoes at me. Don't, don't <laughs> say it. We gotta try. We have right. to try. We gotta stop this divisive nonsense. We gotta stop fighting with ourselves and we've gotta capitalize on what we have right now, which is something I've never seen in my 49 years on this planet, which is a gun friendly White House and George Bush, either one of them weren't gun friendly. A gun friendly White House, Senate, and House. Right. And a new NRA leadership that tells me that they're going after suppressors, short barreled rifles, national reciprocity, and all the stuff that we want done. Mm -hmm. And so we need the, the, the easiest thing for people to do is to join the NRA, go to their website, or if you want to support Hero Hunt and veterans, go use the link in air, the bottom of every one of my videos because I take no money from the NRA and I make that very clear. All that money that if you follow that link, if you share that link, all the proceeds from that go straight to Hero Hunt to help veterans and help uh, wounded warriors and first responders because I can't profit from my, my political activism. I don't want to get money from the NRA. I couldn't right. care less about that. Yeah, well, I, you all know what? I think are we, my I gun think... rights back and I want a better America for my three boys. Right. I think, I, you know how I think we do it because I'm, I'm on that edge as well, you know, and I think it starts with admitting where we are. Like you admitted that you are on the other side. I think I'm out, you know, I have that kind of confusion going on as well. And I think how we deal with it is we actually have to talk to each other, which is one of the reasons why I started putting all the time into doing these live broadcasts every day, because I think we have to have these conversations because until you talk like this, People don't know this, but when you when you start having these when you say what you're saying now, people start thinking about it, right? Yeah, you know. Well, so I'm we seeing need to do I'm this. The NRA and stuff scrolling across the comments, and guys, you're going to have nobody to blame but yourselves mm -hmm. in four years when you when you when you play those 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 partisan politics within our own community, and 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 you want to drive wedges, and you want to say f this guy and f that guy, f that YouTuber, f the NRA. Yeah. Well, you're then the we're going to be you divided. Won't have national reciprocity. You're the reason why suppressors won't come off the registry. You're the reason why we won't get SBRs off the registry. You can thank yourselves when you play those games. Yeah. Because ultimately, ultimately, we have to put our own egos and all that kind of stuff aside. aside. I think you're you're right. We have to. If you want to win, you have to fight. This is something that Democrats, uh, liberals, uh, progressive gun grabbers, people who hate freedom, they're putting all their shit aside and they're and they're kicking our asses. You know. That's you, yeah, you, that's you one of the things socialists are good at, man. Yeah, you were mentioning that, you know, everyone's relaxing because we've got Trump in the White House. Guess who's not relaxing? Bloomberg. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, Moms no. Demand Action, all those groups that, you know, that Bloomberg obviously funds and Soros and all these guys. They're not fucking relaxing, man. They're out there. They're out there plotting against us, yep. figuring out ways, kicking our ass, silently here's, killing us. Here's a sobering stat. Bloomberg in Washington state is either last year or the year before Bloomberg spent $11 million trying to get an anti-gun law passed in Washington state, $11 million. That's the entire operating budget. The ILA has, which is the branch of the NRA. That's the, everybody thinks NRA is a political organization. It's not right. The NRA's core is an advocacy group for the promotion of safe handling of firearms and stuff like that. There's one small group in their building called the ILA, which is their legislative arm that does all the lobbying, that does all the political stuff, and they have a budget. Bloomberg spent more money in one state fighting to get an anti-gun bill passed than the NRA has in their entire budget for the year. That's scary. That's what we're up against. Yeah. And so NRA has to pick its battles. And so we need to tell them which battles we feel strongly about, and let's just whittle them away one at a time. Yeah. And but we need to come together because we need one unified voice when, at, at Washington on Capitol Hill and all of our individual voices won't be heard. We need a spokesperson. And who's best equipped to be that spokesperson? Is it the GOA? No, they don't have the members. SAF love them, but they don't have the members. JAFO? No, no members. NRA has millions of members. And when they speak, everybody on the Capitol listens. And so if we become voting members of the NRA, we can get Adam Kraut on the board. We can do what we want with the NRA, but we need to take a, a militant takeover of the NRA. And Pete Brownell's ascension into the presidency is one positive step in that direction for that, that organization, I believe. Yeah. So give, give the NRA those four years. Stop infighting. Stop saying F the NRA for stuff they did last year or five years or 30 years ago. And 
guys, let's fight to get our rights back and stop fighting with ourselves. Four years from now, we can have all the mudslinging in the world if we didn't get anything done. But is it really going to kill us to give them four years? Yeah. So let me ask you this, Mac. What can we do to make this happen? Can we somehow get together? Like, can we can we have some kind of convention where we where it's not about shooting guns or reviewing guns, where we actually get together and talk about our influence and the things that we should be doing with our influence? Is there something like that that we can do? Yeah. Because if we don't do this, you know, in if the pendulum swings the other way four years from now or eight years from now, whatever it is. Not only will we not have guns, our kids and our grandkids, they won't have it. No. And once we lose our firearms, we lose our liberty. And we're clinging. I've traveled to countries in Europe that are more free than, than what we are here in the United States. Everybody talks about freedom in the United States. When you have armed tax collectors running around kicking in doors and dragging people out and throwing them in prison for not paying yeah. their taxes. And when you, I mean, we have anything but freedom. At, yeah. at any given moment, right now in, in, in our conversation, I've probably somewhere broken at least two laws on some obscure law that was written 150 years ago. We have legislated ourselves into a country that has the perception of freedom. We like to tell everybody we're free, but we're anything but free. Yeah, we were just talking about, um, I mean, under the Trump administration, these guys are, are going ahead with seizing people's assets that are not charged with a crime. Yeah. No, if you have too much money in the car, police are actually starting to ask that question. Do you have any money in the car? If so, how much? What? Wrong answer. Oh, I have $5,000 out of the car and it becomes state property and they don't have to tell you why. And that's under federal drug laws, man. The, the war on drugs has been a complete travesty and that needs to stop, but that's a whole separate discussion. Um, yeah, I mean, eminent domain, the fact that they can just come up to you and say, oh, your $400,000 piece of property, we'll give you 40 grand for it. I don't yeah. want 40 grand. Too bad. Get off or you're going to jail. It's ours. Here's your 40 grand. Shut up and take your money. Yeah, that's, that's not freedom. That's slavery. Society. Yeah. What's that? That's not freedom. That's slavery. It's and not that's freedom. all of us. That's all of us being slaves. I don't think people in America really get that. That, you know, the the the, the kind of slavery these guys are setting up for us, it has nothing to do with skin color. No. You know, or culture. Skin color, skin color is something that's used to divide us and 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 the the anarchists and the socialists and, and, and all those folks are really good at driving those wedges and keeping us fighting amongst ourselves. And for me to, to, to think that somebody is better or worse than somebody else simply based on color of hair, color of eyes, color of skin, colors of their toenails, they have fungus or something. I mean, it's just so <laughs> mind-numbingly stupid to think that people would fight there. The only time I can remember in my life where Americans were all Americans and it didn't matter if you were Hispanic, if you're black, if you were Italian, if you're Irish, whatever. The only time it didn't matter was for the, about 30 days after 9-11. Yeah. Everybody was hugging each other. Everybody was, you know, putting aside their petty differences that, that, that really the politicians make us, they, they cause us to fight over those petty differences. Everybody came together as Americans because we had one common enemy. President Reagan made a, a quip once that you know, the, the conspiracy theorists cling to, where he said, just imagine if we had a threat from outer space, how united the world would be. And, and, that's, and that's true. I mean, if aliens landed in Washington, D.C. tomorrow, black, white, Hispanic, yellow, purple, green, everybody would say, come with me, brother, grab a gun, take one of mine. Let's go kill those suckers. You know what I mean? I hope so. I hope so. But I agree with you. I would. Oh, yeah. But I mean, I would anyway, because I don't see those colors, man. I don't. I, and most of my, I mean, my entire adult life, I was raised in Kansas and that mindset was very prominent, right? It, that, that uh, you know, the Jews, this, the blacks, that, that does, that was prominent in my area where I grew up. But I immediately got introduced to the real world when I joined the military in the 80s. And my first roommate was a black guy, it's Lance Corporal Everhart. And if you're out there watching, brother, shoot me a message, would you? <laughs> I'd love to hear from you, but I mean, someone that was, knows him. Let us know. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it, 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 it. I realized at a young age how stupid and petty that was, and how, how small-minded you have to be. Because in the grand scheme of things, we fighting with each other as Americans over stupid shit. Oh, I cussed on air. No, it's fine, man. Don't worry. <laughs> I about know. It. I never do it. I purposely <laughs> have this filter. Um, <laughs> wow. There you go, guys. Save it. I cussed. Yeah, um, we, we got you got a little bit of over that stupid stuff is is mind numbing to me because it, it distracts us. And that's the intent. It is it's intended to distract us so that they can slide in these laws to better control us. They want to keep us fighting over these silly little things that they come up with. 
saying that white people want to kill black people and black people want to kill white people and we're all fighting over it. Meanwhile, they're passing laws. Yeah, Mac, I could tell you this, you know, um, I wasn't born in America. I, I grew up actually traveling around the world a little bit. And what I, one of the things I learned very early in my life is that this is, this is how they're dividing the entire planet. This is everywhere, you know. Um, yeah. I, I lived in Africa, man, and I, I suffered just like a lot of racism from Africans. <laughs> oh, yeah, a lot of people don't realize that. You know, a lot of people talk about slavery and stuff, and when I tell them slavery is alive and well in this world, and it's in Africa, there's still people fighting over there and taking slaves and selling them as, as sex servants yeah. and whatever else, it's still alive and well. Yeah, it's, right? it's alive in Russia, it's alive in a lot people. of places. What's yeah. that? It's alive in Russia. It's alive in a lot of places. It's, it's alive, alive in the United States. I mean, yeah, it's in America all the time. It, yeah, it, absolutely. it's alive everywhere. Yeah, you know, and the that's why, like, you know, to bring it back to to us as gun guys, I think we have to figure out a way to get together and do this thing. I know a lot of the, you know, there's egos and things like that involved here, right? Because some yep. people are really big and some people are really small. I think we have to matter. get. Yeah, we have to get over that. And, and um, you know, that's why I really wanted to have this conversation with you, because I know that you're one of the people. I don't care what people think out there, but Mac genuinely believes the shit that he's saying right now. You know, this is a real dude. When I when I met uh, when I met you, Mac, I think I had like maybe 300 subscribers. Yep, I remember it was a bullpup <laughs> shoot down at Rock River or Rock. What was the name of that place? Uh, Rock uh, Rock Castle. Rock Castle, yeah, Rock Castle, great place in uh, Kentucky. And I I like I cut off Mac. I, I I saw him in the parking lot with his wife walking into the hotel, and I told Lola, I was like, there he goes, and I cut I cut him off. And he spent hours talking to me. He said, "Hey, you know what? I'm, I'll help you out. You know, I'll I'll do whatever I can do." And here I am, man. I'm like 53,000 subscribers after that. Max still doing things to me. This is how we make shit happen. Right. I mean, and I think we invited you to dinner that night, didn't we? Yes. Yeah. We you had invited dinner. me to dinner. Yeah. And I remember saying, dinner. "I can't believe you're you're inviting me to dinner." And I I tell you what I tell everybody. God, I'm just a guy with a camera, man. I mean, I'm just like you. I'm no better than anybody else. Matter of fact, I learn more from my audience than. I mean, people look at YouTubers and they think, oh, they know everything. And some of them do, like Ian and Carl. I, mean, <laughs> I know they, nothing. They may know everything about firearms. I'm, okay. I still don't know how they get that information. But aside from that, most of us don't know everything about firearms. And I learn just as much from, from my audience. I read those comments and I learn a lot from the comments. And um, it's a two-way thing. But when it gets back to big and small, it doesn't matter, man. We're all in this together. And that's why I told you then. It's like we're all on the same team. We're all pulling in the same direction. And if it wasn't for you that day, I probably wouldn't have the Instagram following I have because you told me I was an idiot for not being on Instagram. I think I posted <laughs> one picture like a year before. And you go, look, you got 2,000 followers. You posted one picture a year ago. And I was yeah. like, oh, yeah, cool. Okay, maybe I'll use this thing called Instagram. <laughs> well, because so, you take because you always have really good cameras. You're into this stuff. And, uh, you know, I was like, wow, people would love to see them because I know you were taking pictures and all that. So now you're just a baller on YouTube, man. You just <laughs> I wish, man. I, mean, <laughs> I do YouTube because it's fun for me. It certainly isn't for the money. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, I enjoy the community. And like one example, when we were talking about moving copper or custom into its new location, we debated whether or not to have a storefront because really local gun sales in Valparaiso, Indiana, you know, it's not like yeah. a, a big city by any any measure. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a decent sized city, but you know, there's two gun stores here and that's about all it can handle, one's all it really needs. Um, <laughs> there's not a whole lot of business to be had, right, at the local level. So we just, we just talked about, well, let's just, you know, warehouse and just do business online as copper. And I said, no, and my partner agreed with me. I said, no, let's let's keep the store open, man. We, we have to have a place for fans to come. Because I remember years ago, Eric, an Iraq veteran, told me when he was still working pretty much every day at the pawn shop, that people would come in from all over the world just to see him. Yeah. And being able to greet a fan in person that you're that accessible that you can just walk in at any given time and find them there is different than what you will find in Hollywood and in broadcast television and even in newspapers or print. Those folks aren't accessible. Right. We are and we should be. And those right? guys still go into Moss Pond, right? I mean, they, they still do. Go to well, Moss they go Pond. in occasionally. So they're super busy. You know, they've grown immensely. And they don't, they're not there every day like they used to be. Actually, no. they live quite a ways away from the pawn shop. Um, but yeah, I mean, and that's, and, that, and that's why we had a storefront. And every single day, without fail, every single day, I have fans from somewhere come in the store, usually four to five fans from 
all over the world. I, I had some guys come in from China and I hope they're watching. Uh, they came in from China, they were coming in, they manufacture flashlights, they went to a trade show in Vegas, they got tickets to Chicago and drove over here, not even knowing if I was gonna be in the store. Yeah. Thank God I was in the store that day. And I sat and chatted with them and they were, you know, I even did an interview for them because they have their own YouTube over in China. Mm -hmm. And we did an interview here in the studios where I'm filming now. And, uh, and I said, hey, you, if you're hungry, let's go grab some lunch. That's and how you said, make what? freedom happen, man. That's how you make, yeah. listen. I did, I took a lunch. But anyway, so yeah, I, I love having that interaction. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know what? I mean, you know, obviously I'm not on, on, on the level that you guys are yet. But the other day, there, there was actually a fan um, that came. He might be watching this broadcast right now. He came into uh, Big Daddy Guns to the store and took me to lunch. That's awesome. I was like, this is this is amazing. It's so humbling, man. When people come in to see you, I don't care where I'm at in town. The guys here at the store know if I'm in town, I'm not traveling. To call me, it happened yesterday. I was at lunch. Hey, Tim, where are you at? I'm over grabbing a sandwich. Hey, we got a fan here. How long? I said, get, give me 15 minutes. Yeah. You know, yeah. I force my food down and race back to the store to meet that person, give them a free patch and thank them for watching the channel and have a discussion with them. If yeah. it wasn't for our fans and the folks that follow us, we would have nothing. I wouldn't have Absolutely a store. Not. I wouldn't have a YouTube channel. I wouldn't have a way to feed my family. I'd be back in corporate America doing what I absolutely hated. I could not stand my life up until I became a YouTuber and yeah. <laughs> basically took a big pay cut. <laughs> and, I love it though. I wouldn't change anything. My yeah, wife. Actually, you know, and we want you. We want you here, man. We we don't want you back in corporate America for any reason. No, I don't want to go yeah. back. And that's what, like, I think this thing is bigger than all of us. And that's what I'm trying to get people to understand. That's like. You know, like you're saying, we're probably overstating it, but I know that I'm not in this just so that I can get like whatever people think. I want to get like free guns or whatever. Honestly, like when when things come in for me to do videos on to review them and all that, it's work. Oh yeah, yeah. oh I know. I, it, a lot of people say, oh I, I wish I had your job, and I will say it has a lot of perks, right? Right. But you'd have to accept my pay, and you'd have to accept my filming routine. I mean, you know what it's like, man. Especially down there in Florida, you have it worse than I do with the heat. You'll notice a lot of my videos are shot on a tripod. I can't afford to pay a cameraman. I have friends that will help out and run the camera every, every once in a while or I grab somebody from Copper on a slow day. But most of the time it's just me and a tripod and I'm out in sweltering heat with 100% humidity. I'm amazed. I'm amazed that you're doing as many videos as you do, man. You're like, I can't even keep up with the videos that you're pumping out. And I'm amazed that you're doing that and running a store and running everything else that you're, that you're doing. Well, I promised my audience, I said, you look, I'm going to make a go of it. When I got laid off, I, I told everybody what happened and I said, I'm going to make a go of it and I'm going to, I'm going to do more videos and I'm going to try to do everything yeah. I can to grow this. I'm going to focus on copper and the, and the, the YouTube channel and I'm keeping my promise, man. We're three years into it now. I can't believe it's been yeah. three years. It seems like yesterday. Yeah. And how many, and how many millions of dollars have you made? You remember when you bought that Bentley? <laughs> yeah, dude. Well, I, I mean, I'm sitting on a mound of, of uh, $100 bills right now. Um, you know, yeah, I know, right? People, people think that, that YouTubers are just filthy rich, every one of us. And, yeah. and we have all this Google money. It's like, man, you need to go start a YouTube do. channel. Tell, yeah. tell me how rich you get. Yeah, if you only, if you only, only knew. It's not really like that. Um, it's not that there aren't some guys that are, but. No, I mean, you, if you had 54 million subscribers, you know, yeah. yeah. Dude, you're, that's you're one dude scary. though. That's one guy. Living, but at five hundred thousand, no man, there's no money in it. Yeah, no, you spend. Uh, yeah. If just looking at your videos, I mean, like the other day when you uh, when you shot the thousand rounds through the P three twenty, I mean, a thousand rounds. Yeah. And you burn it in thirteen minutes. You know how much. But, but in all fairness, that was that that ammunition was given to me by Fioki. So okay. like, I tell people that you know, freedom supports the channel with ammunition. Mm -hmm. um, Fioki for those tests. So the very first test I did that started the whole gauntlet series, mm -hmm. that was just a wild idea. Let's see what the clone and the original do in this extreme torture test. It was, it was right. intended to be a one-time video, but it was mm -hmm. so popular that I started doing tests on individual pistols, you know, still yeah. today. But so that first video was ammo. That's all I could find was some Fioki. And I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, I'll use Fioki. That's what I'm using today. Nine millimeter Fioki. And so now to keep it consistent right after that video, Fioki contacted me and said, hey, if you guys want to do any more of those videos, just let us know. We'll get you the ammo. So for the sake of consistency now, I use Fioki ammo. And what was kind of funny is I knew so little about them in the beginning. I always thought Fioki was a foreign brand. They've been manufacturing all their ammunition right here in the United States since 1985. Oh, I always thought they were foreign also. Yeah. Just Everybody does. I did. <laughs> and it's an American company. So heck yeah, I'm going to support them. Yeah. So, um, 
Yeah, there's nothing. So, listen, can I tell you something? Can I, I? I don't give a shit what like anyone out there that wants to troll you wants to say, but you're a genuine guy. You're a good guy. You're doing good things for the gun community, and you deserve like everything you have, and actually more, my friend. You deserve well, I more. Appreciate that, but than I what you have. I so I, I couldn't. I I am blessed to have what I have, and I, I never would ever say, gosh, I wish I had more. All I want to do is be able to exist, shoot guns for a living, and just make sure that my family's taken care of. Um, my goal isn't to become Bill Gates or get filthy rich. Not my goal. My yeah. goal is right now, especially for the next four years, is to get some of these stupid gun laws undone. Right. Shoot some guns, have a good time, make a few videos and sell a few guns. And as long as my family's got food on the table and clothes on their back, brother, I'm, I'm happy as a lark. Amen, so, brother. That's what, that's what makes a man. That's what makes you a real man. You know? Well, I mean, I think most of us are that way, truth be yeah. told. I mean, you know, a lot of, as we say, a lot of folks, trolls, give us a hard time for what we do and say, go get a real job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my real job, I work less. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, I just have to work five days a week, not seven. Yeah, no days off. You know what? Let's hit up some, let's um, hit up some questions because I know you don't have a lot of time. So, um, no, so man, I'm, good. I, I'm good. I'm good on time. I just got to make sure that I, I let the guys here. I'm at Copper filming in our studios. They'll set the alarm on me in 45 minutes and then I'll set the alarm off. And oh, it's horrible. Lock you in. Yeah. So I got to, I might have to send a text message or something. Yeah. And let them know I'm still here. So let's hit some of these questions then. I mean, that's good. I'm, I'm good for whatever time. So what do you think about reciprocity passing? What do you think is going to happen there? What do I think is going to happen? Yeah. Well, it's hard to predict, man. It's like predicting when the next version of Windows is going to come out. I, I don't know, but I do believe the NRA is going to fight that battle. They pulled their membership, and their membership feels very strongly about it, so they definitely is high on their agenda. Um, I, I would like to think that it could happen fairly easily simply because the precedent has already been set, right? I can drive into Illinois with my Indiana driver's license, and it's accepted. Mm -hmm. States should be forced to honor other states' licenses and permits. Otherwise, how can we have a country? Right. So if they honor my license as a doctor in another state, if they, you know, I can, I, I guess they kind of regulate that, but I, I'm trying to find a good example here. Help me, Hank. No, definitely the driver's license. The driver's is license is a good example, yeah. but if they honor licenses on, in one area, they have to honor them in another. And the fact that I can cross some imaginary line in the sand that's not clearly marked, I can cross that imaginary line, venture over into a, another part of my own country and be charged with a felony, and lose my rights in my home state that says, here's your license. It's insane. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And, and, and it's criminal. And I believe mm -hmm. that people should be angry about it. And so I think reciprocity is low hanging fruit. I think forcing that is, is very simple to do. What I do not want to see is a federal licensing permit system. I don't want the feds in my life. I don't even like the state in my life, but I'll accept a state license for now. I don't want a federal licensing system. I don't want registration with the feds whatsoever, and that's what it would wind up being is, is, is registration. I mean, it's so bad now, they already know when you get pulled over by a police officer, it pops up on the computer screen in many states, if not all, this guy's got a permit, this guy might have a gun. Yeah. So, you know, we're already being, we're already being tracked yes. and we're already being, I mean, we're, we're breaking so many federal laws and the fact that they are tracking us and keeping a registry of gun owners. I, I just don't want that to happen at the federal level. Yeah, we had that conversation, um, like I think last week, uh, we were talking about the um, the Florida state attorney that got pulled over because the guys ran her plates and then it didn't show up. And I was ha actually, I was having that conversation with Matt, with Bank Switch Matt, Deputy Matt. Yep, oh yeah, he's a good dude. Yeah, he is a good dude. Uh, he wasn't <laughs> happy with me because I was like, why the hell are you guys running plates? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, he was saying, yeah, we're not using it for any nefarious purposes or whatever. Well, there's lots of stuff in the news where people are, you know, there's guys that are stealing people's information, you know, their credit and all that kind of thing. I don't like any of that kind of stuff. I get the crime fighting and all that. I'm with it. But there's there's a line and there's too much uh, data being gathered on people. So, yeah, I you know what? We have to find that happy medium and everything, you know, um, I, I'm, I, I, I have always supported law enforcement and I believe, I mean, if without police, we'd have complete anarchy. Right. Uh, most of the people that, that, that hate police have probably dialed 911 in their lives. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they love to hate on them, but man, when they need them, they're the first person to call. Yeah. You know, it, it's, um, I, do we need to control police? Absolutely. Because they're a form of government and they need to be regulated and we need to watch them very closely because police can get out of control. It's very yeah. easy to go from just your regular old community policing to brown shirts very quickly and easily. 
Yeah, and just like anything else, we need to we need to say you know we need to support them, and then when things are wrong, we need to say this is wrong, just like Absolutely. anything else. Absolutely, and we need the police and, and and all the cops I know do. When they see something wrong that's done wrong in policing, they say, "Hey, that's not yeah. cool. That guy out, get rid of him, put him in prison, or whatever." And and we just need the police to do that. That that blue veil, you know, we always support our brothers. I, I don't think that's so prominent as it was maybe in the seventies. I think you're seeing police officers now. Um, at least the, the cops I know, if they know that there's another officer's blatantly doing something wrong, they're going to go to, to yeah. you know, internal affairs and, and take care of it. But that's what we need. But, but even then, you know, the community needs to be in control of its, of its police force because they are there to protect and serve us. They, they, they are tasked with enforcing the laws because we give them permission and grant them access and the powers to do that. And we should be able to take it away if we don't like how it's being done. But, uh, you know, yeah, that's basically absolutely. what's that? No, I absolutely agree with you. You know, something I don't know if I say this often enough, but when I got pulled, I, I put up a video when I got pulled over. I don't know if you saw that. I did. I, yeah. Yeah. That was Go total ahead. clickbait. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> clickbait. Yes, I know. <laughs> and the thing is, is, you know, who was the most upset with that? The biggest group that was mad about what happened to me when I got pulled over. I don't think it was like a big deal that I got pulled over. It's just some things went down like they disarmed me, which they're not supposed to do in Florida. And then even though even when they verified my CCW, they they ran the serial numbers on my Glock. Yeah. So that was terrible. And the people who complained to me the most about that and who are the most upset about that are police officers. See, and that's what I'm telling you, man. That's what I'm seeing, and that's the way it should be. Yeah. Because um, we need to get, we need to bring the community and, and, and the police closer together. Under Obama, we saw this division through the, the media and propaganda from, from the top down where our government was purposely trying to drive a wedge between law enforcement and the people. When I was a kid growing up in, in, in Lawrence, Kansas, which was a small town at the time, we had Officer Fox every Friday night. We go out and drag race on on the drag strip that was 31st Street. It was the last paved road in town, and we had drag race out there. And every night he'd come out at 11 o'clock, and he this would say, "All right, who's got the fastest car?" And we say, "Oh, Johnny does," you know. And he's like, "All right, if Johnny beats me, you guys can stay out here for one more hour. But if I win, you guys go home. If I catch you out here, I'm writing you a ticket for drag racing." And he would drag race us. Now, could you imagine today mm -hmm. dash cam video of a police officer drag racing a high school student? the outrage there would be yeah but it but it's a good thing i mean i think there are some guys who do that like they 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 use would, um they use the the like the race strips and stuff like that to do it right but yeah i mean it should be done in a controlled environment my yeah. point is is that we went from when i was a kid i didn't fear police now of course i've never been a minor, minority or whatever but mm -hmm. I, I didn't fear police it was like they were approachable they walked the, the, a beat downtown. You could walk up to them. They would engage with people. They would talk to them. Then we went to this through this Obama era, where you know the police started to, to separate themselves from the community because the community, in their eyes, was criticizing them for everything. The government didn't even support them, and we had this division developing. And so cops wouldn't engage with, with just regular citizens anymore. They're more standoffish. They treated everybody as if they were the enemy, like a military type thing, and. And that's not what needs to happen. We need to bring police and people back together. And that community yeah. policing thing is how you do it. And we need I, to I mean, I, the police. I, I agree with you that it has something to do with Obama and Eric Holder. I think it, it also, I mean, it started before that. It has a lot to do with movies and, and, and what the news well, media and, and the, and the media putting out there. Yeah. Is, the media has played a very powerful role in demonizing. I mean, when you, but when you have a president of the United States, after a, a shooting happens that goes national, and you have a president of the United States step up to a microphone hours after the, that, that shooting took place. Mm -hmm. And he said, that could have been my child. That could have been my son. Can you believe that? How damn you can't at that point, you can't even find an impartial jury. He no. didn't even wait to see what the facts of the case were. It was yeah. just white police officer shoots black man. It's and, the, and the ironic and thing is I'm going in front of the media. I'm gonna make police look bad. Yeah, and the ironic thing about that, the ironic thing about that is Chicago is one of the worst places on the face of the planet. I tell you what, America. I'm more scared of the police at night, <laughs> or used to be, not so much anymore, but man, I mean, I have friends that have some stories to tell, but that comes from the daily administration, more or less. Um, yeah, Chicago yeah. is the one exception, I would say, because there yeah. were times <laughs> I've seen some pretty sketchy stuff done. <laughs> yeah, and Rahm, and you know what's crazy? Rahm Emanuel's over there, not not doing anything. I know, man. It's See, not that, helping. 
it's a complete Illinois is like its own own country. It, yeah. It's it's like California. They don't play by the same rules free America plays by. Yeah. You know what I mean? When you have a cage unit is to harass gun owners. If you're if you're a FOID card, which is a license, you have to have this permit to even own a firearm. The day it expires, they're kicking in your front door to drag you down to the police station. Man, that ain't right. That's yeah. that's it's, that's crazy, it's, man. It's horrible. It Trust me. It's happened. Yeah, I've seen a lot of horrible things happen. That's where my perspective comes from. So, uh, one of the viewers says, without cops, we're fucked. <laughs> so, What's that? Yeah. One of the viewers says, without cops, we're fucked. That's true. Yeah. Unless you're an anarchist, you believe that, you know, but that's what's funny. I mean, if people truly like the anarchists always crack me up, they say we don't need any government. I don't agree with that either. I mean, that's that's another extreme view. If, if you want to see, you know, in, in, in the sci-fi sense, if you want to see what the world would be like without any government, just watch seven or eight seasons of Walking Dead. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people like Negan, that's what happens. People naturally, it's, it's in human nature to organize. And when you have an absence of a controlling body, like just a general government, people will come together in groups and they will victimize other people. They'll take advantage yeah. of people that aren't in another group. And so they'll naturally come together and fight. Take a look at any place in any small country where they have a very weak central government. There's constant fighting between the tribes. Afghanistan yeah. is a perfect example and we're over there now. You know, yeah. the tribes would fight with each other because there were two groups without a really strong central government that, that, that imposed, you know, enforced a basic set of laws. Yeah, when I was a kid, I lived in Nigeria and um, Nigeria kind of like went back and forth for, uh, between civilian government and military government. And yeah. I could tell you every time it, there was a civilian government, it was batshit crazy, you know, Armageddon chaos. You know, yeah. we literally had to like hire bodyguards, you know, armed guards and all kinds of craziness. I mean, people were getting killed in the streets. The yeah. electricity was always off. It was just insane. And then when the military, I'm not saying I'm like promoting the military, but when the military took over and, and started putting some people on firing squads, then, then the elect <laughs> electricity ran and it went back to order. Right. You know, so you don't, I think there's a lot of people that really want to see everything fall apart because then they think they can get like, Maybe they can get women they couldn't get before. They could get this car or do this thing or that. No, no. it's it's that's a fantasy. Yeah. That's not going to happen. And that's why I tell folks that that want a second American Civil War. No, you don't. You don't want to be shooting at your neighbor. You don't want your children killed. And whatever you think you're fighting to preserve, or whatever you think that you you want to install as new government, you want to go back to the original Constitution. There's just as good a chance, or just as likely of a chance that some dictator will come to power and seize that opportunity and take control and you'll have nothing. Yeah. So that, that's a very, very risky thing to hope for. I do. I never want to see a civil war. I hope and, and, and pray that we can get through the problems that our country faces using the system that was put in place by our founding fathers. Um, but if we have to get to the point where we secede or we have to do take drastic measures, to, to achieve that goal, I'm all on board. Everything short of a civil war, because that's the last thing I want to see, man. Absolutely, I agree with you. That okay, let's hit some more questions. Uh, what do you think about states like California? I'm laughing at this. Sorry. Yeah. What do you, What do you think about states like California? <laughs> what, what What do I think about them? I think it sucks the way they have to live, man. I mean, what, that's what happens when socialism takes over, man. I mean. The people that want to live free, that live in California, California is a beautiful state, man. But the, the, when socialists take over, man, that's what you get. You get bankruptcy, you get tons of crime, and you get more and more and more restrictive laws. I mean, it's a microcosm of what's going on in Venezuela right now. That's, it, California will become Venezuela. Illinois will become Venezuela. That's what happens. I always tell people that they say they're socialists and they supported Bernie Sanders. I say, okay, give me one example, just one example of where socialism didn't end up with millions of people dead and didn't end up in a complete catastrophe where the government imploded on itself. Just give me one example. Mm -hmm. Let's see if anybody can give me one. I'm Silence. Uh, I, I, Good luck finding it, right? Yeah, I definitely don't know of one. Um, socialism yeah. is, is, is victimizing a certain class of people. It's turning the table so you go from yeah. the wealthy victimizing the, the poor to the poor victimizing the wealthy. And neither, neither solution is correct. Yeah, and so, eventually you run out of the wealthy. Um, and and 
you know, I think the, the problem that's happening in California, most of the people who can leave have left because a lot of people say in these cases, you know, just leave. And I get it. But that's why I left New York. When we came to America, we lived in New York. I left there a long time. Uh, you know, I think we moved from New York back in like the uh, late 90s or something like that. So, yeah, if you can leave, you can, you know, get out of there. But I had to leave my family behind and, and a whole bunch of different things, reset my entire life, start from zero. You know, Lola and I were, we moved from New York to New Jersey and we realized that was worse. Yeah. <laughs> and right so, out of the frying pan into the fire, right? Yeah. And it was so bad that to get out of New Jersey, Lola and I were literally every weekend with our kids at flea markets selling our shit <laughs> so that we can get the money to move from New Jersey to Florida. And that's how we wound up here. But not everyone can do that. So now people are stuck in there. And they're and they're kind of like they're still good people. They're still gun guys and, and freedom loving people there, but they're kind of stuck and they yeah. can't get out because they have family or jobs and all that kind of stuff and they can't get out of there and they're just like sinking in the quicksand of, of socialism that's happening there. I know, and 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 you know, those folks that want to stay behind that they're raised, you know, born and raised Californian, they're not gonna give up and leave. They wanna fight for their state. I mean, God bless them. There's there's lots of them, man, that refuse to leave. Um yeah, I don't know what to say to them. I don't. I don't know how they fix yeah. what's broken. I, you know, what one of the things we I, I that we're doing at Copper that I think is absolutely hysterical, is that the California Highway Patrol is retiring some of their old Smith and Wesson automatics, and they're the old school Smiths, the forty oh six S uh, T T S Ws, I think they are, um, but they're forty caliber Smiths that have a rail on them, and they were only made for the California Highway Patrol, and they have a special serial number. Well, they're retiring those pistols. And so we found out about it and we placed a bid on it. We, we got all those pistols, right? <laughs> I know. So, so. <laughs> so we were getting all these, these, these highway patrol guns, which have special, special serial numbers, which collectors are going to want because it has CHP, you know, California Highway Patrol, and the serial number. Yeah, chips. And, and it's a gun that was never made except for the California Highway Patrol. The M&P was already in use for over a year when this gun was commissioned and built by Smith & Wesson for the California Highway Patrol. Um, but what's, what's funny about that is we got them at a good price. We're selling them at a very good price, but $15 of every gun sale of those California pistols, Highway Patrol, 15 bucks we're donating back to the gun owners of California, which is a lobby group that fights for gun rights in California. These cool. are guns that I couldn't even sell to a California citizen because <laughs> the Cal California roster doesn't allow for this handgun to be in California. So they can't even own this handgun. But in the 49 other states, we're going to sell them or we're going to take 15 bucks from every sale of their own freaking guns and we're going to give it to an organization that can hopefully help fight to turn back some of those laws. And that's how we do it, man. We just got to think yeah. of special ways that we can help our, our brothers and sisters in these, these god-awful states to turn the tide back. It's not insurmountable. It's not, and, and we get beaten down and you start to think it can't be undone, but it most certainly can be done because Illinois, I think, formally declared bankruptcy. California has to here soon. There's gonna be a reset in those states. And hopefully during that reset, some of the stuff that's been done uh, politically and, and, and through the legislation, uh, le legislative actions against firearms and firearms owners can be undone. I mean, that's all we can hope for. I don't know, man. Yeah, absolutely, that's good. Okay, so uh, I just wanna hit up this, uh, this is a statement that someone has here. I don't know who said it, but uh, we have more segregation with Obama um, than previous presidents. What do you think about that, Tim? We have Thank more you. more segregation with Obama? Yeah, they said that with Obama, we had more segregation than we did with previous presidents. So I in other see, words, I, I people- think, I, think, I think Obama helped galvanize certain elements on both sides of that argument. So, you know, the Black Panthers and the Klansmen, if you will, you take those two radical groups that, you know, historically have hated each other. I, I, I think that I don't think there was institutionalized, you know, racism or anything like that. Or segregation, not, yeah. There wasn't I, institutionalized. I think that people were, because he was so divisive that people felt it was okay to be divisive themselves. So that kind of, it's kind of like top down, right? So, and, and that's why I say that we had problems, more, more problems with the way the public perce perceives police. We had more problems with the way the public perceived um, racial divisions and racial issues in the United States. I think that Obama did make it worse. We took a step back because he made it okay to hate white people, right? right. Because it was the white cops that were victimizing the, the black citizens. When we had that one shooting where a white officer killed a black person, 
that very same day out west, we had a black police officer kill an unarmed white person. That didn't make the national news the very same day. Mm -hmm. But the media and the Obama administration focused on the white officer shooting the unarmed black person. Yeah. But that, so that's a weird. When that, that happens, it causes that divide, right? Yeah. People become galvanized and people start to believe, yes, they really hate us and the cops hate us and white people hate us and they're killing us in the streets and we have to do something. And it gives rise to groups like the BLM, the Black Lives Matter group. You know, that's a response to that divisiveness of the administration, I think. Yeah. And I think what um, people don't realize about that first with Obama, um, Obama got into office because white people elected him. You know, mm -hmm. black people didn't come out and vote enough. I mean, they never have, right? So even with him, they didn't come out, they didn't break any records and come out and vote for him. So he got into office because, you know, there's lots of white people out there that elected him, ironically. And then, you know, when they got in there, they decided to be decisive, divisive about everything, but at the same time say, oh, we're gonna bring everyone together. And then they're and then behind everyone's back, they're backstabbing people. And I think the people that do that are the media. I'm not saying that, that they, did, no, the they don't do it. It absolutely does. Yeah. So if you look at what's happening, for example, with um, with how this Australian, this blonde uh, Australian woman got shot by cops, and she happened to get shot by a black cop that has a Muslim name, right? He's uh, And I think he is he is Muslim. I, I don't uh, know. I, I've read the story briefly, but I, there's no facts out there yet other yeah. than it happened. Well, so, you know... I, so amongst my people, <laughs> amongst my people, there's. And, and I see how you are. I see <laughs> yeah. how you are. <laughs> yeah. Now you know, amongst black people, they're like, "Oh, look at this! You know, this white woman gets shot, and then everyone cares about it." No, you know what's happening? First of all, you can't really say that because the media has been pushing every time a white police officer shoots someone that's black. They've been pushing that. Yeah. Right. They push these particular things, but then they also choose to push this. It's the same thing. And, and I know this is happening. If if uh, if a young black kid disappears um, somewhere in the country and, you, and they can't find this kid and, and, and he goes missing or whatever, it doesn't make news. But if a, if a you know, blonde, blue eyed, cute, you know, white girl disappears, it makes news. And, and, and then everyone. So people have a misconception that there's some kind of like institutionalized, there's people like, oh, we don't care what happens to the black kids. We only care what happens to, you know, to this white kid. No, that's the media that's doing that. You have to stop paying attention to those people's asses. Yeah. You know, they're the ones doing that. They're pushing it. They're choosing yeah. to put out this story over that story. That's the thing they do all the time. But see, in, in the traditional media, how they get their their ratings is by eyes on their content and they're constantly trying to outdo each other and blood sells yeah. violence, racism, anything that you can find that's a hot button item that sells. And so they always start, they always lead the stories with who shot, who, who did this, who blew up what, and then they trickle down to the actual news if they ever get around to it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the media doing that. But the media also serves a political, it serves as a political force and you will find like during this last election, I made a point of surfing the different major news networks mm -hmm. during the election. And, you know, you watch Fox and they're talking about Trump primarily. You watch CNN. They have a picture of Hillary in the background and it's all blue. The backdrop is all blue. Very much a left slant, very much a right slant on Fox. You know, everybody has, there's no such thing as unbiased reporting. It seems like all the news networks have their agenda and they serve it to the point where when the government says, hey, NBC, can you not run that story because it would make the president look really bad? NBC won't run that story. Mm -hmm. Perfect example, the Monica Lewinsky case. None of the major news networks would touch it. It took an independent blogger called Matt Drudge to run it because nobody else would touch it. Yeah. Because that would be damaging to the White House. And the White House, it was called the Clinton News Network for a reason. And they wouldn't touch it, but a blogger did. And boom, all of a sudden the internet and blogs were on the map because mm -hmm. he talked about something all the other networks didn't want to talk about because it may damage yeah. their White House. Yeah, I totally so agree with you. They very much have political motivations. I totally agree with you. And here's something that's been formulating in my mind. I think that's even worse. I've been thinking about this a lot over the last few years. When you, If you go to the movies and you look at movies, and I'm talking about sci-fi movies, superhero movies, all kinds of movies that are coming out, you actually see the same fucking people that are sitting up there as news anchors, and they're supposed to be telling us the news, 
and they're in the movies talking about these aliens or these superheroes. Have you noticed yeah. that? Yeah. That's yeah. bullshit. You see that yeah. from like Fox, from CNN, from NBC, yeah. from all these places. How the hell are you supposed to believe these people are serious, real news reporters when they get up there and they're in a movie? How do we right. know that everything that they do is not acting? You know, now right. they've got their, their SAG card. They're actors to me, man. They're all bullshit. And that's why we're turning away from them. Yeah. No, it's, it's true. And people are turning away from it. It's killing them because people with independent voices like ourselves and bloggers and and everything, we represent the people. We don't have corporations standing behind us. Now, is that to say we don't have a political agenda? I most certainly do have a political agenda, and I don't think anybody <laughs> knows would think that I don't, but at least I'm open about it. So if you're watching me, listening to what I have to say, you know I'm a pro-Second Amendment guy. I'm probably a single-issue voter in most cases, and if you want to listen to what I have to say, then you're going to tune in. But when you go to CNN, their motives are hidden. Their mm -hmm. message is deceitful. And that's not just true of CNN, it's true to Fox, it's true of all the major news networks. All of them. And, and so that's why people are looking more and more to the blog. So you have the guys that lean left reading salon.com and you have the guys that lean right reading Drudge Report. So you can go to your own separate news sources and get the information you want, but nobody's looking to the media anymore because nobody trusts them because they're so underhanded and so yeah. dirty in their really? dealings. That and then they're just, it's all about sensationalism news. They got to they gotta lead with whatever bleeds, man. Otherwise, they, it's clickbait, what we in our, our world call clickbait. Yeah, look at where young people are getting their news today, Tim. They're getting their news from comedians, late night comedians. Can you believe oh, that? I know. Shit? Oh, I know. And most people couldn't tell you who the first president of the United States was, but they could certainly tell you what Kim Kardashian wore yesterday. It's so, insane. It's insane. And the news media, in the next morning, the news media will repeat what a fucking comedian came on. I'm not against comedians. I, I think uh, ask Lola. I'm a, I, I'm like, I'm a closet comedian, right? I'm not against them, but they're, they're um, rebroadcasting what a comedian said last night. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's like when people link to the duffel blog and use it as a news story, they get taken by the duffel blog or the onion, you know, it's like yeah. those, those comedic websites. Yeah. It's insane. It's insane. Okay. So uh, let's, let's go to some things. We'll come back here. Uh, someone wants to know, um, what's your EDC? I think you spoke about this earlier, but we've got people jumping in and out. So. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to break my own rule and 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 I'm going to take out a loaded firearm. I'm going to clean it for you or clear it for you guys. Don't shoot me. Don't shoot Nobody me. Nobody panic. I'm pulling the weapon out. It's a CZ P01 compact. I'm going to go ahead, unload it, and then just make sure that it's clear. So the weapon's clear. Um, this is what I carry. And a lot of folks have watched my videos that watched some of the ballistics tests that I did. I really do carry the Lehigh Defense ammunition. When I say, everybody goes, oh, you're just a paid show for Lehigh. No, actually I'm not. I wish I were, but I'm not a paid show for anybody. Um, I tested it, I believe in it, and that's why I carry it. Um, and then the CZ P01 Compact is what I carry. It has, um, has the Mepro uh, TFX Pros for sights and uh, VZ grips and then the triggers Cajun gun works. So yeah, that looks really good. How long have you been carrying that as your EDC? Uh, over a year now. So I, I went from- I remember Glock. when you left Glock, I remember that, that was his- Yeah, I, I, I left Glock and then I, I carried a VP9 for a while. Then I, I had a, a falling out with the VP9 and I started going from <laughs> Three o'clock, which I'm actually surprisingly carrying on the hip right now, open carry at the store. But when I'm out walking around, I usually conceal carry, and I carry appendix. And, I, and so I decided when when the VP9 wasn't going to work for me, I, went, I started looking at double action pistols. Uh, I adopted the Sphinx. What be it, the promise was that they would have night sights for it very soon. After six or seven months of no night sights, I, I have to have night sights on my defensive gun. I said, screw it, I'm going to the CZ or the original. So I, I changed guns, but I really didn't because the, the Sphinx is a Swiss made copy of the CZ. So I just went to the source and I was able to get my night sights and, uh, and I have no plans on changing. So I carry double action because I carry appendix. It gives me just a little bit of extra breathing room. When I go to holster, I can put my thumb over the hammer. So when I go to slide it into its holster, if there's anything touching that trigger and it starts to move that hammer, I'll feel it on my thumb and I stop pushing so I don't shoot myself in the burrito. Okay, so, so uh, yeah, so what um, what holster are you using for that? Um, I'm, I'm carrying a high threat concealment holster right now. So okay. I, my, my I, I go back and forth, there's a local company called Contact Concealment 
that when I get a new gun in uh, and I want to holster for it to play around with it, see if I like it, they can make one for me very quickly. And plus I've carried their holsters for quite a while, but then high threat concealment. I did a video a long time ago about their, their, their war belt of sorts. Uh, they started, you know, making inside the waistband holsters. I started trying one of those out and that's what I typically carry right now uh, is the HTC or high threat concealment inside the waistband holster with this little pistol. Cool. What other EDs, like what, do you have a knife? Do you have flashlight? What else do you always have? have? Always have a knife. Um, these are, I'm not a knife fighter. I never will profess to be. These are glorified box openers for me. Yeah. Um, this is a combat Tradun. It's, it's a Microtech. And the only reason I have this knife is because I bought it at NRA show. Microtech had a booth there. And these things are ungodly expensive. I think regular price on them like on Blade HQ is like 450 bucks and I just can't justify that. Well, they had them for $300 distributor pricing and I've always wanted to combat Tradun. I've always purchased the cheaper ones. Um, oh, see, that's how bad I'm not a knife guy, but the, the lesser expensive version of this, which you can get for less than 200 bucks. Uh, but this is truly it's badass, awesome man. out the yeah. front. And so I bought this at NRA show. This is why I carry around, um, but knives will change. I have a bunch of knives. I call myself not a knife guy, but one, when one gets dull, I'll give it to my buddy who sharpens them and I'll grab something else. I probably have like 15 knives now. Cool. So what, what flashlight. about flashlights? This thing I've had for at least five years. I got to find which pocket I have it in. I swear I've, I've lost it more times. I think I've already lost it again. <laughs> <laughs> Where is it? Oh no, it might be on my desk. I know it's here in the store somewhere because I had it today. Like, Where'd my flashlight go? There it is. All right. This thing is a Powertech Cadet, and you can probably tell that it's well used. Yeah, that is worn. That's like battle worn, man. <laughs> I've carried this thing, I'm going to say four to five years now. I had it when I went to Israel. I think that video is four or five years old now. So um, I've almost lost it. I don't know how many times. It's extremely bright. It runs on a single one, two, three battery, and it's never failed me. It's, like I said, insanely bright, has a strobe feature. It has a um, little rubberized cap here. I figured I'd get dry rot by now on this, but it still is sealed and works really, really well. So PowerTech Cadet, man, it was just, it was a cheap light. I bought it at my local gun shop. I figured I would lose it because of its small size fairly quickly. And somehow I've managed to keep this thing. And I thought I've lost it for real, like at least 20 times and panicked. And, um, I don't even know if I can get another one of these. Yeah. So, what are you carrying, man? Um, I okay. This is gonna be. <laughs> I was hoping you, <laughs> right. It's like I always tell people: leave loaded guns in the holsters. It's not playtime. Well, oh, what am I carrying? Well, I've yeah. been like, I've been maimed. Here, I'm putting me, mine away, guys. So yeah, I'm gonna have to uh, let me uh, take out my thing and clear it and all that kind of stuff. Don't have okay. a desktop live on YouTube. Yeah, no, we don't want to have that. So I'm carrying the, uh, you know, I'm still a Glock guy. Glock really? 23. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that, man. Yeah, this has maimed me. I was carrying a Glock 19 all the time, or I would switch to a Glock 26. But this has kind of, like, maimed me since, uh, you know, it came along because it's just so, I don't know, I feel comfortable with it. But what I do before people start complaining that that's not enough ammo, I always carry one of these. I saw somewhere that no one carries a backup magazine, so I typically have like at least you know two magazines, man. What ammo are you using? Um, I, I no idea. Really, just hollow point? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've, yeah, I'm using hollow point stuff, but um, and it's all it's all the same stuff, but I can't. I have, like HSTs or something. It's hard to tell. I got you on a small mod. Yeah, and or, these are old. I probably need to cycle these <laughs> cycle these out or whatever. But I don't really pay that much attention to it. What I do is I do buy a couple of boxes. And I test it and make sure it works in the gun. Yeah. And then once I know it works, I, uh, I, I, you know, I carry it in that gun. But because you know people buy defensive ammo, but they just get one box. They just get enough. Yeah. And no, then, you got to test it in your gun. That's um, if you don't do that, that's crazy. It's like yeah, yeah, yeah. And so buy ammo and not and carry it, and not use it. You got to put yeah. hundred rounds so, to it to make sure it functions. Now I had a I had a. Yeah, I had a totally different knife, but this is a Spartaco. I actually got this from the late Boy Scout. Cool. Don't ask me what kind of knife it is because I, I know it's Spyderco it. just by its design, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, it's a, you know, it's a good knife. I like it. It's lightweight and everything. I'm carrying that. And uh, flashlight. Let me see if you even recognize what kind of flashlight this is. What in the I, I world? like it. 
This is a Caltech flashlight. I don't know if you know this, but Caltech used to be cool with me. <laughs> now they hate me. <laughs> but, uh, but you stole a flashlight on the way out? What? Yeah, I yeah. I managed that thing. That looks yeah, good. Yeah, this is really cool. This is like it has like a trigger kind of thing. These are very expensive. If you uh, you can buy these off of uh, Caltech's website or from the store and all that kind of stuff. Very expensive. But um, you know, I like how it looks, how it feels, and all that. It's got a nice clip on it. Huh. So I've always got it. I'm not even sure what it's called either. I'm sure people out there are like, damn you, Hank Strange, you don't know the name of anything? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can't remember Lola's name most of the time. <laughs> so there you go. But that's that's what I can't remember. Check that out now because that looks cool. Is it really yeah. bright? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Check it out. Hold on. I, dude, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Very bright. laughs> so I always carry I carry like multiple flashlights because I think flashlights are really important so even on my keys when I pull out this is probably terrible but this is what my keys look like so I've got like on my keys I've got a knife <laughs> actually a multi-tool on my keys I've got another flashlight but this one probably doesn't even work and then um, this is really cool this is the Keymate uh, USB right so this is from Streamlight check that out and I will show you how bright this is. You know. Wow. Yeah. So this is actually really convenient. So if I happen to not carry my flashlight around for some reason, I'm going home when it's dark, I'm trying to open stuff up, I could just hit that. And it recharges by USB. So I could plug it in in my car so it doesn't wind up like this one that's not working right now because the battery's ah, dead. there you go. Yeah. And I forgot to change it. I'm kind of like getting into USB flashlights for that reason. I don't know about you because... I, I want them to work when I need them. Yeah, I have um, I, I I I have the LED. Before that, I had a what was it? Streamlight flashlight. I think it was what the light. There. It's been so many years now. I forget what it was. No, it wasn't Streamlight. What was it? Surefire. It was a Surefire. It had a Surefire light. Okay. That, um, it had a bulb in it, mm -hmm. and it's amazing wh where we've come from in terms of. Um, and Omar found the stool. And <laughs> Omar brought his CZ. <laughs> <laughs> so uh -oh. we call Omar the Scorpion King around the shop because uh -huh. he, he everywhere he goes he has this scorpion with him. And oh, uh, that's his that's his EDC. <laughs> it is his EDC. I'm not kidding. <laughs> Hold on, guys. We got to make a little room here for Omar. I'm yeah. gonna drag the screens around here. Omar, you're gonna love how I have it. See, Omar's my IT guy, and he knows how to work computers. All right. So let's get so this. You don't do, you don't do your own. Hold on. I gotta. You guys should hopefully know Omar. I'll bring. Microphone over. There you go. All right. How's it going, man? How's it going, Hank? What's up? All right. Now let's get. I don't think I've ever met Omar. Omar. There we go. You like how I did this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Omar. Omar sets all this stuff up because I screw everything up. Uh, we do it. He helps us with our Facebook live streams, and he has all the audio and the computer and everything. Yeah. I'll have to take a picture of it, but yeah, he does a that lot of stuff a, on the shop. That is a sweet copper custom shirt right there, man. Did the, everybody here wears the copper, the Mac shirts? I always wonder where they go, why I can't find one, because Rory's out of my size. It's because everybody here has them. They're, they're, but they're loyal. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. a pretty. Yeah, go ahead. That's here's a pretty a, bad. Okay, so let's see this. Hold on. Let me lock. Let me lock it on you here. Whoa. Yeah. That's beautiful. So he has beautiful. a form one pending. So he has the SB tactical side folding brace on it. And I'll let Omar tell you about everything else. Oh, geez. Okay. And basically, uh, the three main companies that the, the parts that I have are HB Industries, Parker Mountain Machine, and uh, Yeti Works. I got the Yeti Works grip. Uh, Parker Mountain Machine chopped down my barrel for me from the factory 7.72. So it's so like, like a short little barrel. It's like a 5.3 inch barrel now. And I got the HB Industries micro handguard on there and all the HB Industries like accessories, like the triggers, the springs. I got a CZ custom disconnector and uh, Silence Co. Mega 9K and a nice little package there for home defense. He, what's, uh, the, what's the optic? It's a Trijicon MRO. Love them. Great optics. Yeah. And uh, it's got a Surefire M600 Ultra on a tape switch. Oh, cool. So he, um, like, if you guys, we carry a whole bunch of stuff to modify these. We painted this one flat dark earth. We do the Cerakote at copper. We did a tungsten gray today in Cerakote. Yeah, we have one in tungsten gray now. Um, but, yeah. He anytime you send a gun in for us to customize, paint it, or whatever you want this gun built. I mean, Omar does all the work. He is literally the oh, scorpion sweet. king. He lives and breathes this gun. <laughs> it's sweet. like you watch our videos together where we're out shooting them, man. It's like this thing's like attached to him, like Velcro. He won't won't let it out of his sight. 
it's amazing the following that this the the scorpions getting versus like uh the mpx or something right yeah i think that's mainly to do with uh just the price point and the 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 thing is with the scorpions they're so affordable 7.99 is what they usually go for uh from any not yours yours is my, i'm sure oh, yeah going way <laughs> over that car with <laughs> well this one specifically is uh, three thousand eight hundred and eighty-two. So. Damn. <laughs> three thousand dollars. <laughs> wow. Dude, that's way over like a scar. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I mean, for the base gun, uh, you even even when, uh, with some of the aftermarket modifications, they're like twenty, thirty dollars a piece. Where the Sig MPX, like the mags are yeah. sixty-five dollars. The gun itself is fifteen, sixteen, seventeen hundred dollars. And you're talking about proprietary parts like the you can't even use an AR style an AR charging handle in it, even though it's an AR style charging handle because yeah. it doesn't fit. You can get me on so a rip like, on SIG products, man. SIG drives me batty. They bring out the Gen One MPX, and then they don't increment the nomenclature of the gun, and they bring out the the Gen Two. But you can't really, unless you know what you're looking at. If you're a consumer, you don't know what you're buying. You could be buying the gun that uses the black follower magazines, or you could be buying the gun that uses the green polymer. Or green follow, follower magazines. You don't know because Sig won't tell you. They don't even know. I called to get a 300 blackout part, and they yeah. asked what gun I have. I'm like, uh, I don't know. They said, give me your serial number, and, and I give them the serial number. They go, Oh, you have the generation blah 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 blah. There's yeah. so many so many different parts. Their guns are constantly changing, and they don't mark them differently. So you don't know what you're buying. It drives me nuts. And even yeah, though the Scorpion's proprietary, like all the parts are affordable. The magazines are twenty dollars a piece. You look, so. yeah, they're fifteen dollars. I see somebody blowing them out. You look hungry, Omar. This, this guy can eat like two pizzas. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a human garbage disposal. That's a very cool. That's a very cool gun, man. And I especially like the Copper Custom shirt. So we got to, you know. Yeah. We're getting more of them, so people will be able to buy them soon. <laughs> we'll have them on the website. He also does all of our website stuff. So. Oh, sweet. Okay, so you're the guy that makes uh, Tim look like he's all super amazing, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the banner pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you make him look like he's doing, you know, it, it, people might think out there that, that Mac's doing everything. <laughs> he's, like, doing his own internet. <laughs> no he way, does, right? He does a lot. Sometimes uh, I worry about Tim. He stresses us. Uh, he stresses himself out a lot, doing a lot of stuff. He works very hard. So. <laughs> yeah, he's hyper. You get to see the behind the scenes, Mac, the one that, that's always like crazy, running in circles. Okay, so here we go. This is cool. Ooh, look at this. So I was really excited about getting this. It came in today. It's the nine millimeter GSG. Ooh, yeah. Nice. It, it looks the part, but wait till you see the video. Uh oh. Yeah, I don't know yet. <laughs> I mean, I haven't fired it yet. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. It's yeah. Uh, basically what it looks like is you know GSG is known for making twenty twos. 22 yeah. versions of popular guns like the MP5 and the STG44, right? Right. And so they, they probably decided, well, heck, we need to get in the 9mm game, so let's do that. The problem is, is this thing looks just like one of their 22s. It's yeah. all it's all <laughs> cast parts. I mean, it, it looks great on camera. It looks the part. It does, yeah. It looks good. But it's um, I'm, I hope it works good. I'm kind of concerned, but we'll see. When Connor yeah. saw it from a distance, he got really excited. I know. We had a guy walk in the store, and I'm holding this. He's like, oh! <gasps> <laughs> and, then season, oh, and he thought it was a 22. I said, no, it's a nine millimeter. And then kind of, the, oh, came back for just a brief second. And then we'll see. Yeah. So we're going to, we're going to take it out and play with it and see if it runs. Okay. I've, I've met, I read mixed reports, but this was just sacrilege. So on the original MP40, this was the takedown tool or knob. You would take the gun apart uh, by turning that knob. Okay. Now this is the fire control, uh, fire, safe, fire, safe. <laughs> Hmm. That's going to take some getting used to. It's dumb. I'm like, no. So, yeah, and you have to take it apart with tools. Where the original, you, of course, can just turn what is the selector lever on this gun. You could turn that and just take the gun apart. Now you need to pop off a what I call a Jesus Christ clip. It's a little C clip. You hit it and it goes across the room. And you go, Jesus Christ. Um, <laughs> that's how you take it apart, that stupid little clip right there. But anyway, so I'm, I'm yeah. we'll see. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. I'm looking forward to it. I know you, it'll be no holds barred on that one. Okay, so... You want to get, let's get back to some questions. Um, I know you're into cars, right? Folks out there want to know what kind of cars, what, what kind of cars are you into? I, I don't, I don't, I used to do cars when I had a good paying job. Um, I used to, I used to be like in a Mopar, had a, yeah. uh, you used to a have a Challenger. SRT8 Challenger that I had uh, built by Mr. Norms. And uh, yeah, I missed that car. My kids missed that car. When I, when I, when I left corporate America, that car had to go bye bye. And, uh, I took the proceeds from that and bought paid cash for my Jeep, which I'm going to be driving for a very long time. 
Because you're and, a family uh, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had to make a decision. We wanted to make a go of Copper Custom and, okay. and uh, all that stuff. So I'm not a car guy anymore. But my, my goal is, is hopefully in the next 10 years, I'll make enough money where I can at least buy one more hot rod, put it in the garage, and then I, that's the last one. I'm at the, that point in my life where, sadly, I'll have one more hot rod before I die, probably. Well, if you won the lottery right now, mm -hmm. oh, boy. Which, what would it be right now? Cars that exist, what would you oh, buy? I mean, I think it would be two choices. I think number one would be the new Demon. Uh, I knew followed it. Followed by the, the ZR1. One of those oh, okay. two. Okay, I knew it. See, for people who don't know, see, I got my Challenger, you know, and I thought I was like hot shit. You know, 485 horsepower and all that in my Challenger. It's the Scat Pack. So I put up, uh, I put up photos. And then Max sends me, he still has photos of his car he's talking about. <laughs> he's like, dude, um, mine was like, what was it? A thousand, eleven hundred horsepower? Oh, no, no, no. It was, it was, it was 600 horsepower, but okay. I mean, at the wheel, at the crank, it was 700 and some odd horsepower. It would be yeah. comparable to a Hellcat today, probably, in terms of how fast. You could put it in second gear and hammer it, and it would get sideways. Yeah. Every now and then I get those messages from Mac, you know, sometimes it's just like, <laughs> this is a reminder. I don't have that anymore, man. It's, it's, <laughs> it's gone. I had a lot of money tied up in that car. Had uh, for, for you Mopar guys that know who Mr. Norms is, uh, he's not building cars anymore. He came out of retirement for a short window there and he built my car. And um, he's like really, really famous in the Midwest. He used to have a, a dealership in Chicago, was known for muscle cars, did the Hemi, Hemi under glass and all that stuff. Um, and then he retired right after he built my car, but he signed my hood underneath the hood and I had it clear coated. So I had his signature on it. Whoever has that car has a collector's piece. I was going to ask you if you know so, who has it, but I needed to. You don't know who has it now? Some collector has it. Oh, would you ever try to get it back? If I had the money and I could get it back, I would buy it back in a heartbeat. Okay. It's one of a kind. It's, mm -hmm. it had actually, I did demon before Dodge did demon. I have a demon tail stripe on it. And on the, on the front of the, I took all the badging off of it. And then on the grill, it had a 1960s era demon badge on the grill that I'd found on eBay. So it was, it, and it had a, a tail stripe on it and it had the original demon logo in the tail stripe. Cool, cool. Um, so. Do you feel the same way about that car um, that you do about some of the guns? Because I know you've had some real badass guns in the past that you've, uh, you know, sold, sold because you needed to, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. I think if it's ever been commercially available on the US market at one point, I've owned it pretty much. I mean, I even had a PSG one, I had a, uh, a belt fed HK 21 mm. back when you're making lots of money, you could buy lots of cool toys. All those are sold. I wish I, I wish I hadn't sold the PSG one simply because it's a horribly, I won't say it's horribly inaccurate. I've shot guns that cost a fraction of the price that would shoot circles around that gun. It was a one, one and a half MOA gun at best, but everybody has it in their mind. The PSG one is like through the same hole at a thousand yards and it's just not. Okay. But yeah, it's, it's some of the stuff I've had in the past that I, I miss, but yeah, what do you do? Uh, you know, it, it, it still may come back around, man. It's not over yet. You're not done yet. <laughs> I'm 49, dude. It's almost over. Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, I know you, man. It's, you're not done yet. Okay, so this kind of, this seems kind of crazy because we didn't cover it in the beginning, but that's because Lola wasn't here. So what's your background? <laughs> She's shaking her head at me. What's my background? Yeah. So for folks who don't know, like, how did you get into this whole thing? You know, what's, what were you doing before? So this whole thing, the YouTube thing? Yeah, the YouTube thing. What did you do? You know, um, everybody asks that. So, and what's funny is when I tell people, they they the trolls use it to beat me over the head because they think it gives me some sort of unfair advantage in in social media. But I used to work for an advertising company. Um, I went to school, studied criminology, uh, was going to become law enforcement. But then uh, talking to the various agencies I wanted to work for, FBI, DEA, um, I realized very quickly that they couldn't guarantee me, even with a college degree, a field position where I could actually go out and do investigative stuff. You, you just mm -hmm. kind of have to work your way up to it or whatever. And I was be, being very impatient. I, I thought, no, man, I, I get a degree. I get to go into field investigations and I can, you know, be an agent. That's what I want to do. And when I realized that wasn't going to happen, uh, the, the whole internet thing started to take off. That was in the, the mid nineties. And, um, and so I got into the internet thing. I was still going to school. I started a dial-up bulletin board system, for those of you old enough to remember what a BBS was. And I uh, had 24 phone lines coming into my little rented house, and I was selling internet services for 10 cents an hour. Had a 56K, line, uh, 56K leased line and sold internet for 10 cents an hour. Uh, and then I realized the internet might be something. And then uh, 
I did that for a few years, grew it, sold it to another company and used that to move to Chicago. And there I started an advertising agency around 1995 called uh, Digital Vision Communications. And we sold that to a much bigger company in 1999. And then I just went to work for corporate America, no more entrepreneurialism, just drew a paycheck from 1999 until uh, 2000. What was it? When did I start doing this full time? 2000 when I quit. I can't six, remember when I quit that stuff. It was three years ago, I guess. So yeah, it, it, yeah, I don't know. I guess, I guess I got laid off like 14, 2014 or 20, uh, 27, 2015, 14 or 15. So then I started doing YouTube, but the whole time in 2008 is when I started the channel and it was just for, you know, giggles. I just giggles. Because, yeah. yeah. I mean, no, none of us got into this because we thought we were going to, you know, make a half a million subscriber YouTube channel. I just posted goofy gun videos. I used to be pretty active on the forums. Um, and I would, I would post Yankee Marshall. I mean, he was very active on the forums and we'd go back and forth. And when we bought a new gun, we would post pictures of it and type out our thoughts. And I thought, what the heck, I'll check out this new YouTube thing, which I think got started in like 2006. And I made a short video, did a little review of the gun and then posted a link in the forum versus typing out a lengthy review and with pictures and all the other stuff. And people liked it and said, do more. So I started doing more and it just kind of snowballed into what it became today. So no, no planning at all. It just totally fell into it. Yeah. So you and Yankee Marshall have been going at it for years then. I've known him. Yeah. Long before you <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. What is it? That, that makes his gosh, man, nine, 10 years, 10 years of known him to the, to the discussion forums and now on YouTube. It's yeah. Kind of crazy. And people, some people don't know this because sometimes, um, like I remember one time he got into, there was a bunch of people that were mad at him because of something he said on one of my videos. He's not a bad guy. No, he's not. I, yeah. I love that he's opinionated and he's very witty. He's like Mr. Colian Noir. I wish I could come up with the, the, the witty things that just flow out of their mouths. I mean, he's, he's very dead serious. He's, he's, I don't know, almost abusive, I guess, but it, yeah. his style is just, yeah, he I has kind of like an ironic comedy, up, man. right? It's it, fun. He's, What's he's that? kind of got like an ironic comedy, like a dry wit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, he, he can really rip something apart very easily. He's really good at that. But, um, but just how he's, he's his self deprecation. I mean, he makes fun of himself. He makes fun of other people. I think in the most, I, I, every time he says something about me in video, my inbox blows up and <laughs> yeah. he said something about my sweet, sweet ass in one of the <laughs> about a Kimber revolver. It was one of my patrons had said it. They said, Yankee Marshall's talking about you again. And I, I said, link or it didn't happen. And he sends me the link. And it was just buried in a, in a random Kimber revolver video. He bought a Kimber revolver. Why anybody would buy a Kimber revolver, I have no idea. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was like a couple of shot shows ago when they came out. Yeah. 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 Not, not my cup of tea. But anyway, he slid in some jabs at uh, Nut and Fancy, called it the toilet, the toilet paper project or something. And, and then... Uh, he said something about me and the, the the sweet sweet ass thing. So, yeah, Yankee and I have known each other for many years, and we we rib each other and have a good time. But you know, in reality, I like him. I, I, yeah. the, the funny thing is, is all these years I've never met him in person. Oh really? Well, nope. I thought I wouldn't. Um, I have met him. I met him a couple shot shows ago, and I thought I wouldn't like him in person. And it's funny. I met him, and we wound up like standing in the same spot on the floor and talking for about three hours. Yeah. I, I want to meet the guy in person someday, maybe a shot show. He just started going to shot show. Um, and I even told him back when you had to get into shot show, you needed three um, companies saying they wanted to do interviews. So you get your credentials. I told him I'd get him the three companies and stuff, but um, he didn't ask me to help him in that regard. And, and I think he got in. I just didn't see him at the last shot show, but the last shot show, I was only almost there for like two days. Go. Somebody tried to kill me as soon as I landed. Yeah. Um, this is crazy. We should talk about this. You know, I know that we've been going for a while, but at first, you weren't going to go to SHOT Show. Now, famously, um, some people didn't, like um, Eric from Iraq Veteran didn't go to SHOT Show. I know there were yeah. people from Iraq Veteran at the show. Yeah. So, And then you said you weren't going to go, but you did wind up there and at the end. What happened? Um, well, it, so many people want me to go. Um, it's just, and, and I know a lot of people, I mean, when you're in the social media space, people critique you and criticize you and, and stuff. And a lot of my fellow YouTubers gave me a blast of poop because I, uh, I said when I wrote a blog post saying why I was gonna, not going to go to SHOT Show anymore. And pretty much it's just, be, it's, it's, it's the same thing every year. There's nothing there. 
that really truly excites me. It's a true pain to go there for me. Yeah, you've almost uh, died at Shot Show, I think. At least. I mean, yeah, I got. I mean, I caught the bubonic plague one time, and then I, <laughs> last year I landed some guy rear ends the car I'm in like yeah, hundred miles. You had a high speed chase with someone. Yeah. Was, so I mean, what was that about? God's telling me to stay away, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's just I, I have more fun at NRA show because Shot Show is this group of a bunch of pretentious inner. You know, it's 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 like it's 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 the community, it's it's the the manufacturers and the retailers coming together to kind of stroke each other, and I just I'm not running around shooting videos, doing booth reviews because I can't go up and see the new Sig P320 and touch it for five seconds and go, this is going to be the greatest thing ever, guys. Look for the review soon. I just don't see that as being content for my channel for my audience. I'm not saying mm -hmm. it's a bad thing to do. Lots of people do it. It's just when I was doing it, it felt wrong and it wasn't something I wanted to do. So really it has nothing for me. I can't really do any serious commentary about the new stuff that's there other than hold it and say, here's what it looks like. You can get that from a picture on the internet. Right. Um, I think so I just really, and then going out of my way, going there and you know what it's like, man, you've been there. It is yeah. a freaking madhouse. You get sick every year you go um, because it's just like you get everybody from all over the world with every plague known to man. They all show up in Las Vegas. And then I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't gamble. And, and so there's nothing there for me to do after hours. I go to the first party and an hour into it, everybody's drunk. I'm the only sober guy in the room. And if you're one of those people that don't drink, you understand just how much fun that isn't. Right. And so I wind up sitting <laughs> in my room, you know, and, and doing nothing. So, um, or just trying to find a, a, a restaurant that isn't packed to the gills and getting a good meal that isn't $200. So, yeah, it's just it's tough. I think that I think that people don't truly understand how tough it is to go to Shot Show. Um, it's expensive to go out to Las Vegas and stay there. People might think that someone pays for you to come. That you know they fly you out there on a private jet. You know, like your you know little bow wow or something, and then they put you up in a hotel room. It's you're spending your money to go out there, and then you're doing all this work. And uh, you know, even for me, like we're smaller, so we are trying to do videos. But it's incredibly difficult to do those videos. I know that there's some guys that they they try to break records every year. Like, oh, this year I did 200 videos. This I know, I did, right? <laughs> 300 and I videos. I got 50 views to each one of them. Man, I'm crushing it. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, you, it's you it's know, oversaturation. And, it's too much. Yeah, and we can't, you know, it's, and here's the real, the, the, the thing about it, like you said, you're in someone's house, so they have their canned message, they're going to give you that canned message, and it's also very rude of you to go into a booth for a company, like, that spends tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars in some instances to be at this show and then try to tear their thing down. It's way better to do that later. Right? <laughs> not in their presence, so they can't punch you. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's not so, it's not necessarily the easiest thing in the world to go. Some guys do this, by the way, at Shot Show, um, and it kind of creates animosity with those companies because they're there to make these big sales. Yeah. You well, know, that's, that's what's really that's how it started, man. It was it was a buyer show, mm -hmm. and uh, it was where you know manufacturers and importers would showcase the new wares and take orders for dealers. Right? Dealers would come in like, oh, that's awesome. P, SIG P320, new product, I'll take 5,000 of them. That's what mm -hmm. it was originally. Then it turned into a media circus, and then it turned into everybody and their brother was getting their relatives and friends and non-industry people into it. And like Media Day turned into a complete joke. If mm -hmm. I was a manufacturer, I would not spend $1 on Media Day because half the people there have no business being there. Right. Um, you know, and they tried to clamp down on it because you have, you know, John's best friend's wife's brother's daughter-in-law up there shooting the new pig the SIG, I keep calling it the pig, SIG P320, <laughs> you know, on the firing line chewing up their ammo, which has a very real cost for that manufacturer. And they're not media, they're not industry, they're not a buyer. They're yeah, there's never guy. gonna be a video <laughs> or yeah, there'll never be anything. And 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 a lot of manufacturers have gotten have, have gotten mad. And you've seen over the years more and more the big companies are renting ranges and doing private parties and inviting the media they want there. Yeah. They know will give them coverage. So they're getting money back or they're getting some return on their investment versus this big chaotic mess that is shot show, which is one of the many reasons why I never want to go back. I, I, I say I won't go this year, but chances are I'll fly in for a day or two. Um, the Godfather has to show up. People are going to complain. So I know. Nah, it's just, I, I just don't like it, man. I, yeah. I, I, love, I, I love the NRA show because it's not industry people. It's just regular people you'd meet in a gun shop. One of the yeah. guys here in comments, uh, Kevin, uh, had mentioned uh, NRAM is is basically like a bunch of dudes you want to hang out with. That's exactly how I view it, right? 
Yeah. It's not a bunch of pretentious industry insiders. It's 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 just gun guys, right? Yeah. You can actually buy things there. I bought a knife there, and 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 you can hang out with your actual viewers and have fun and and yeah. Like, I think at shot show, show, at shot show, a lot of there are companies that do care about us. They know that we do things for them, and they're very nice at shot show. They absolutely are. But there's a lot of companies that are like who gives a shit about you <laughs> at shot show. But you go to NRA and. Um, I don't really, it's not really that much. I don't care about the companies, but you see people who are like, Hey, thanks for doing this. You know, I really appreciate that you're doing these videos and, and they're just ecstatic to, to be able to see you. And to me, it kind of like refuels me. Yeah. You know, I think I burnt out on this years ago, man. I'm sure at this point you've like burnt out and burnt out and burnt out again. <laughs> yeah. I, I've, I've yeah. burned out on the shot show thing. I've, I don't think I'd ever burn out on NRA just because yeah. It is hanging out with just regular shooters, and yeah. it's not a bunch of insiders, and uh, it's 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 a lot more fun. So I always yeah. go to NRA show, yeah. especially they always keep it local. I think this next year it's going to be in Dallas, which is a bit of a trip. Mm -hmm. I've never I've avoided going to Dallas because it's so far off the beaten path. Because usually it's in like St. Louis, Indianapolis, Louisville, uh, Nashville, Atlanta. You know, so when it when it's in the mid Midwest, I'll I'll always hit it. But um, I think this year, for the next four years, while I'm, you know, advocating for the NRA, I need to be at the show. Otherwise, it makes me a bit of a hypocrite. I can't stand being a hypocrite. So, yeah, <laughs> I think uh, since this show is going to be in Dallas, I think Colin Noir needs to uh, put us all up. I'd love to stay at his place. You yeah. know, it's funny. It's just like when I got to the show this last year, there's this big like banner of of Colin Noir, and I took a selfie of me next to it, and I texted them. I said, I think this is as close as I'm ever going to get to having an actual picture with you. <laughs> we keep missing each other. Like we'll run into each other and then people will pulse away and we almost talked and then we got yeah. separated. And uh, this year actually he laughed and we made it a point and we got together. I have a real picture of myself with him this time. Oh, that cool. Was the first yeah. First time I've actually met with him. We've talked on the phone, I don't know how many times and stuff. It's just so funny. He's a, he's a genuinely good guy. I think at some point we have to get him to run for office. Oh, I agree. But see, what's funny is I knew him back when he was that 2000 sub channel and he was posting on, uh, um, defensivecarry.org or .com. It was a forum, and I was watching his videos, and they had a distinct, different style to him. Like he did a lot of B-roll and, and voiceover, and you know his style, man. He's, yeah, yeah. The, the, the man is a wordsmith, and I sent him a PM. Said, "Hey, man, if you got a chance, here's my cell phone number. I'd like to talk to you." And he calls me up. He's like, "Man, I can't believe you want to talk to me. This is just so crazy." It's like I watch all your videos. And I said, "Dude, I just wanted to tell you that." Whatever you're doing, keep doing it because you're blowing away regular content. You've changed it, right? You're, you're doing truly unique firearms content. And uh, we talked and spoke, became friends. And then like a year, he called me up and said, man, NRA is talking to me. Should I talk to them? And I said, yeah. But at the time, I was kind of anti-NRA. I said, just be careful, you know, but definitely talk to them. And next thing you know, man, boom. He's rock star. Rock star, yeah. yeah. But he's yeah. never not taken my call. I mean, he's, you know, it's, it's, it's always kind of funny. I always tell people, even, even you, man, like when you get big, just don't forget that we were friends once, you know, right. it's like, cause a lot of times people will get so big that the guys that they used to talk to, they would, they're like below them now. Uh, that's I'm going to tell you to switch. I'm going to tell my him. bodyguards to bounce you out. Like, <laughs> I'll never do that, man. I'll never do that to you. <laughs> Good. I will. I'll never do it. And if I do do it, call me on it publicly, man, yeah. because I, that's one thing I don't want to be is one of those. D bags. No, listen, uh, I will troll you though. I tried to troll you the other oh, day on Instagram. Dude, I, I, I love you. I, I troll back if I see it. Yeah. Well, you didn't see me. I was trolling you on Instagram because I put up a post where I had like 10 bull pups in one picture and I was like, I'm the bull pup king. And I was like, I know oh, this, is gonna, this is going to, this is going to make, you saw that? You got to be more, I mean, trolling is like trying to get me mad, man. You got to, no. you got to post something that, what in the world is that on your phone, Omar? I'm looking at this Instagram. But something popped up. Jeez. Bo Did you just see booty? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Omar, now we screen. all have to see it. Oh, he's going through your Instagram right now. Oh, yeah. We oh, all so, have to oh, see it. Okay. I was he, like, he, I he hope this. <laughs> yeah, I thought this was gonna make you go like, what? Because I put in there Instagram. Uh, what did I put? I think I, I saw the picture. Bullpup King, and I thought, okay, Mac is gonna throw up bullpups now, and we're gonna see a bullpup see. flame war go on. <laughs> All right, I you got one there. I don't have. <laughs> All right, yeah, you you actually may have more of them than I do. Now, actually, someone asked me. Um, someone said to me, "How many of those do I actually own?" I only own seven of those there. Three of them I borrowed. 
Oh, okay. So right. you, you so probably I know me. I always, I always have to be winning, right? Yeah. That's so I, thought, I, thought, I thought you were going to bite the bait on that one. 22 Plinkster insisted I come down to his place and we shoot a video. And we do a competition of his choosing. I said, Dave, I don't want to do that, man. What if I beat you? And he laughed at me. <laughs> <laughs> I said, all right, dude, I'm coming. Uh -huh. And I go down there and I beat him by one shot. And his, on, on, he had home field advantage. He set up the course of fire and I beat him by one shot. Uh, how's he taking that? He's crying. He didn't take it very well. He, this yeah. is how flustered he was. So I, I had a trophy made, and <laughs> I, and we we I went there with this little trophy, and then at the end I made him film a scene where I you know accepted the trophy <laughs> and gave my acceptance speech, and he doesn't remember me grabbing him, putting my my hand over his mouth and kissing the back of my hand like I kissed him on the lips. He totally forgot that, and so I kept dunning him and saying, "Hey man, when are you gonna post that video of our competition?" And he. He had every excuse in the book. I don't have internet service. I need a faster computer. <laughs> Meanwhile, he's posting videos of other things, right? Yeah, that's the place there. <laughs> You're running out of excuses, brother. You need to post that video. And then he calls me up. He goes, you kissed me. I said, you don't remember that? And he goes, no, man. I was so flustered by the whole he day. Was mad. <laughs> I forgot totally that you kissed me. I didn't even know you did that. I yeah. said, you got to put it in there, man. That's part of it. So, is yeah. fun, man. He's fun. Oh, he is awesome. There's so many good people in our community, yeah. man. What I, I like about him, he's fun to make fun of. Like, you know, <laughs> if you he is him. fun. He's such a good he's such a good sport, but he's such a nice guy, man. It's yeah. like you can't be mean to him because he doesn't have a mean bone in his body. Like, he can be mean to me, man, and I just soak it up because mm -hmm. you know I can take it. Yeah, yeah. let's hit let's hit some questions because I I don't want to okay. keep you here all day. Okay, so um, have you seen the new IWI? Which the one, the three hundred eight? Yeah. I haven't handled it. I, I, I've known it was coming for a long time, um, but I haven't seen it. So it's kind of funny. Everybody thinks that like I'm in IWI's pocket and I'm not. I actually had to wait and get one of the 556 five, Tavors through normal channels and you know all that, not Tavors, uh, the, the Aces, the little Aces. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, man, I probably won't see one of those until, I mean, we're a stocking dealer. When, whenever they become available, we actually get our hands on one. That'll be the first experience I have with it. But um, yeah. the days I, of them I, get, giving me a gun three months ahead of time and being able to shoot it and, and do video and then release the video when the product launches, that's long gone, man. There's bigger fish out there than me now that they talk to. So Yeah, but I know you carry it because I sent a friend over to get a Tavor from you. No, X, it was an X95, I think. Yeah, the X good. Well, thank you for doing that. But yeah, yeah. the X95, it, I, I, I'm torn between those two. I don't know which one I like better. So while I'm, while I'm in this indecision period, I'm just carrying them around my BCM. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, uh, I, I don't know which one I like better either. I like my original Tavor, but I think it's because I went through so much to get that thing. <laughs> well, I like the original Tavor. I like its magazine release better. Yeah. Um, I, hate, I hate the mag release on the X95. Do you I also have, have an 18 inch, inch barrel to bore? Yours is 18 inches? No, I like, oh. both mine are 16. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah, I Which have the one, one like one more yeah. talk. Uh, I, I, I think I'm uh, partial to the X95. <laughs> I okay. like the X95 a lot. The, the ergonomics. Um, yeah, the X95 think, is an improvement. I don't think the, uh, the accuracy is as bad as some people make it out to be. It's definitely not as great as it's for, but hopefully some companies start making like some aftermarket barrels for our, hopefully, yeah, for the X95 or something. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see how it happens with that. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. What about the MDR, man? That has been like, I don't know. Everybody, you know, <laughs> I was going to type that downstairs. What Should we start MDR? that? <laughs> right. So I got invited to this press thing three years ago and I wasn't the only person there. I just got invited with a bunch of other press folks and they, they rolled out the fourth generation of the MDR prototype. And it was a very rough prototype. And I understood that. They told us that. And it was just to let the world know that this is what they were working on. But it, a lot of the parts were 3D printed. Uh, the guns would run maybe two magazines before they broke something like a firing pin or, or whatever. But again, most of the parts were 3D printed. And I've watched it now. They've had a lot of turnover at Desert Tech. So a lot of the guys I used to know aren't there anymore. And I don't have the inside line to MDR. All I know is that when I do talk to them, I'll reach out to them and say, hey guys, status. And they're like, we're still working on it. You know, one of the first ones that rolls off the line, you know, we'll get it to you, but we'll have to get it back real quick because, you know, yeah. it has to go around to all the gun riders. Right. So I will see a test sample at some point. Um, but 
I don't, I don't know when that'll be, man. And they've not given me timelines. All I know is I just keep looking at them at the di different shows. And every show, I see fewer and fewer 3D printed parts. Mm -hmm. The last show, it looked like it was a complete rifle. So I think they're getting pretty close. But yeah. I think they're really close. Um, I know that you you didn't spend a lot of time in Vegas for Shot Show, but they had a private event. And uh, I went to that and they were having problems. So, so I have a video of this. We were on the line and uh, someone would shoot it with one round would go through. They would have to cycle it to get the other rounds through. And uh, when I when I stepped up and I shot it, everything worked great. And then I actually sat down with the uh, CEO and we had a conversation. And he said the reason why they had the problems was that they were using match grade 308. That's what he said in the video. So I, I put up that video, but then what we found out after I posted the video is that because um, they because like you said they've changed people and they've changed their PR guys a lot yeah so the PR guy brought in um, 6.5 Creed more and not 308 <laughs> so what was happening was they were shooting uh, the 6.5 Creed more through that gun get out of here and it was yes. working at least a little bit yes and I was like oh shit <laughs> wow so, you know, um, that's the that's the last thing that I heard about it. They probably, you know, I'm never going to hear from them again. But because you know, I had to put that that's, up in the video. That's pretty awesome. If that gun will cycle six five Creedmoor and and run a magazine. That's pretty dang reliable. I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, they had to they had to cycle it. They had to cycle it through. It would do like one or two, and then they would have to cycle it. But yeah, you know, that's crazy. Um, and I think, you know, mistakes happen. I, I wouldn't hold that against them, but they just keep getting into things because and then they keep promising people, oh, it's coming out now, it's coming out, it's coming out. And I think there's a lot of people in that price category, which, you know, bullpups tend to be expensive and you're looking yeah. at in the, in the two thousand dollar price category. There's a lot of people waiting. Right. Yeah. So, you know, that's a big thing. I mean, while we're talking about it, I don't know. I, I think you know about these. I think you know about these guys, but so I've got this here, so I'm going to pull it up since we're pulling up guns. Mm -hmm. Does this yep. look familiar? S. Yep. Yeah. So I've got one of these. I think this is a pretty good 308, pretty good bullpup that's out there. Oh, is you that know? the 308? Wow, man. Yeah. This is the 308 version. Um, they don't do it in this bronze kind of thing anymore because it's kind of difficult to get the finishing on this level done. So this is kind of like a unique color. I, I do own this now, but I think this is good. So far as bullpups go, for lots of different reasons, I like the trigger and um, the fact that you can replace a lot of the parts, it's DPMS, it's all metal and all that kind of good stuff. But, you know, yeah, that's little guns. Yeah, as well as the RDB, you know, um, even though I don't exactly get along with Caltech, I think that's also something very innovative that's out there. I think I, I told Caltech early on that the RDB is so well engineered in terms of its concept of how it functions that with a little bit of work that would be a, a weapon that i think foreign militaries look at seriously yes it's, it, it is that downward ejecting system solves the problem of what to do with the spent case that everybody's tried fn with their fs 2000 throwing it forward it was reliable but man talk about swiss watch internals in, ter in, in terms of everything and most of those parts were plastic the mm -hmm. riser that took the spent case up was plastic and there's so many things you would think could go wrong with it. I have two of them that, you know, yeah. knock on wood, I've never had a malfunction with either of them, even shooting steel case. Mine either. You have, yeah. yeah so I mean, we're reliable, but if it's still an awkward way to get rid of a spent case, that downward ejecting system, man, where it draws a spent case over the magazine and throws a spent case out behind the magazine and goes forward, does two things. The scar shoots really soft because at the end of its bolt travel, it doesn't stop at the end of the magazine like the M16 does it can travel further back and let that spring decelerate that bolt and carrier and then it goes forward. Well, the same thing happens with the RDB. By making it come back so far over the magazine and then flick that round out at the very end, it's that hang time that gives it the perception of very, very mild recoil. And so it, it's amazing in terms of, then when, then when I first took one apart and I realized how stupid simple it was on the inside, it didn't yeah. have little tiny polymer risers and stuff like the FS2000. <laughs> I was like, man, this yeah. if this thing works, this thing's magic. I have two of them, and I've never cleared a malfunction, I don't think. The first time I opened that top cover on my FS2000, I was like, I made a mistake. <laughs> <Close it. laughs> Just don't look in there. It's like sausage. Oh, my God. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, we um, Big Daddy Guns has one here. I know that when I initially, because I did a video where we put, uh, I got one, we put 500 rounds through it suppressed. And and what you're talking about, I think one of the things, the benefits to it, it's, it, it, it works well suppressed because those gases for the most part go down as well. Mm -hmm. You know, but I, I know they weren't happy with the video that I did and I wound up sending that thing back to them. But I was just shooting one recently because we have one here at Big Daddy Guns and it's still that. You know, there's certain things. Um, I think I was complaining about the, the fact that there's no QD points on there. And there were some issues with the GI mags, which you and I talked about, but that's not really a big deal. Right. I don't know yeah, if that's still going on. My, my guns, both my guns run the GI mags. I think there's just something goofy. But I mean, in true Caltech fashion i mean everything is super super simple so mm -hmm. if you look at how the magazine latch works it's basically a piece of spring steel that's wrapped around the magazine well mm -hmm. and it's it's really ingenious it's so stupid yeah. simple and that's why i think it would make a great military weapon if it you know they took it to a gen 2 they did something about sealing it up because it basically its guts are completely open to the world in the ejection port you can look mm -hmm. right into the receiver anything mm -hmm. gets up in there the gun's done you know, seal that up. If you have a way to, to open the top cover, give it a top cover where you can clear a malfunction easily mm -hmm. or have access to your chamber, just a simple press and pull tra trap door style yeah. arrangement, just something to get to the chamber to clear a malfunction and then and harden it. So, it, you know, there's no debris that can easily get into the gun. A Gen 2 would be a phenomenal Amazing. weapon that, that, not that the Gen 1's bad. I love my Gen 1's, but I'm not going to yeah. go to war with it. it work, they work flawlessly for me on the range. But if you wanted to make it a military weapon, it's it's one step away from being probably one of the best military bullpups ever adopted. Yeah, but, and a lot lots of lots of people actually really like the California version. Um, you know, even if they're not in California, there's something uh, about the uh, ergonomics of it or something like that that I've heard a lot of folks saying they would rather have that. I think uh, Kelgren's like a modern day Kalishnikov, man. Yeah, I mean their their owner that does all the engineering. I mean. You think about it. People like to give them a hard time um, about quality, and 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 you know, they've evolved. You had a, a very small company that their core business wasn't manufacturing firearms. They just kind of got into it, and then watch them when they started producing these really innovative weapons. Then people started buying them, and they had to grow to meet that demand. And, and there's two things that can kill a business: no growth, and then explosive growth. Mm -hmm. And both can be just as hard to deal with. And they had to deal with explosive growth and that's tough to do. Yeah. And um, so they're doing the best they can. I mean, I, I know this in the last five years, they've evolved a lot. They went from having stuff everywhere and complete disorganization to being ISO 9001 certified. Um, you know, they're, they're definitely passionate about what they're doing and what they're trying to accomplish. I think the people there are definitely loyal to, to the owner and the management and, it's an American company making American firearms, man. Yeah. You know, um, I think if you look at it in the light of, I know I complain about this all the time. There's um, like everyone in their mama is making an AR-15. <laughs> I know, right? Oh, <laughs> right? We complain so, about that all the time here. Yeah. So it's great to have a, a company doing that. The thing that I would knock about them is that they do kind of have like, you know, they're like a cult inside, but I get it, you know. Um, I think you'll find that any manufacturer, you know. It, it's, yeah. But I, I agree, man. It seems like it's like, you know, Springfield Armory and shame on them for their antics in Illinois, but Springfield Armory, uh, you know, they had all this hype. This, you know, there's something coming, the same. <laughs> and they spent all this money on PR and they go, bum, bum, bum. It's an oh. AR-15, less than a thousand bucks with UTG parts on it. Yeah. I was like, wah, wah. Like, are you serious? That's yeah. the best you can do? Right. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. of all the things they could have done, they could have brought back the Johnson, you know, and th this is gun geek right there, but they could have bought, brought back the Johnson and, and, and 30 out six. They could have done something totally new. They could have done anything. I mean, at one time Springfield Armory made M60 belt fed semi-automatics. They could have done anything. These guys have designs that they've shelved. I mean, we know this is true, right? We know yeah. they've got cool designs out there, but they've shelved it. And who in their right mind thinks today in this market, it's a good idea to introduce yet another AR-15? It's like there's f literally 500 companies making AR-15s under yeah. various brand names. Yeah, I think they have to think about who they're taking advice uh, from. And I think that's how we got into the, to the problem that we had with uh, 
you know, Springfield Armory and uh, Rock, River Arms. Rock River Arms. Yeah, I think that they don't necessarily, they're not taking advice from the right people. I, I understand they're, they're big, they're getting busy, but you have to be really careful of who you're taking advice from. It's almost worth it to consult some, some genuine gurus out there. Like maybe talk to someone like you before you do this shit. Oh, you would, you would think so, yeah. <laughs> You'd think that you would talk to some, the shooting community, but you, you know when, you, when you're a big company and you got a lot of money thrown around and you're sponsoring big shooters like Rob Latham and, and you, know, you have um, you know, Rob Pincus and they, they throw a lot of money around and you saw who all those people were that rushed to their defense when they screwed over the Illinois gun owners and the, and the small yeah. FFLs. You saw these people that are highly paid you know, spokespeople for them come to their rescue, but I think that when you get you surround yourself by these highly paid yes men, that's all they do is when they come and yeah. say, "Hey, what do you think about a new AR-15?" Yep, oh sure, yeah, that's great, man, go for it. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. Because you're not getting an honest opinion. If they would have came to me or you or any real shooter, they would have said, "What the hell, dude?" And it, yeah. no, forget you know it. No It's like AK-47s. Right. Think of something new. Yeah, it's like Michael Jackson, right? If no one said to Michael Jackson, you know what, Michael? Might not be a good idea to have sleepovers with people's kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's that kind of like someone has to say that to you, you know? Right. I, I think that's the problem that we have out there with a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, I, I mean, I, I uh, listen, have you, I, this, I'm completely changing the uh, subject right now and switching gears. Did you hear about what happened? It seems like rock stars are not making it anymore, man. Did you hear about the Linkin Park singer? Chester Bennington? No, I mean, I know you mentioned something to me. That yeah, he it seems like he committed suicide, you know, and, and I, you know, I'm not really a big conspiracy theorist guy, but this is like, it's kind of disheartening to see that so many of these guys are committing suicide uh, nowadays. I don't know what's going on, man. I don't know either. It's, yeah. you know, it. I, I remember when the whole Kurt Cobain thing happened and it just seems so weird. He He hated his fame. And there's a lot of people out there that's pretty good. I mean, I watched a documentary on it. It's it's pretty compelling, the fact that he was probably murdered and didn't commit suicide, but I don't know. I'm not a computer mm -hmm. conspiracy theorist. I don't get into that stuff that much. But, you know, for somebody to not be able to deal with the fame that they've created for themselves seems awkward, right? So you go and you become a rock star. You start playing in front of audiences. You strive to get signed to a label. You get everything you want. And now all of a sudden you can't go to the grocery store without somebody recognizing you. And that makes you want to kill yourself. It just... I don't know what his motives were. I don't know if he, I don't know anything about it. I don't know if he left a note or anything, but you know, and Kurt's supposed suicide, you know, it was this, he couldn't deal with the fame and he, he just didn't like being in the public eye. Um, then yeah. don't be a rock star. But I mean, you know, either if it's the, if we can blame it on the drugs and I'm not talking about the, what's no, illegal talking, drugs. It was drugs, man. It was drugs. It was drugs. Yeah, I think that the that the prescription drugs that we have out there, man, are doing a lot of damage to people. Because I know, isn't that the same thing with Chris Cornell? Yeah, I think so. You know, so yeah, that's the, Chris passing, and that sucked too because I really wanted to go see him in concert. Yeah, and and the same thing happened. You know that that uh, he basically killed himself. So I'm I'm kind of worried about that. You know that we're kind of moving into this thing because on one hand you have all these kids nowadays that look at Instagram and they're like, how come my life is not like Kim Kardashian on Instagram? And they want to achieve that. And then you have people who actually have that. And and this guy, from what I read, you know, he had like six kids and he was married and everything. Why do you have that? And you uh, achieve the success and fame and everything and then do something destructive like this. There's definitely something going on in our society. That yeah, not they, they say that Chester's issue was was uh, illegal drugs, not legal ones, or not prescription. But yeah, yeah, okay. that's uh, uh, how did how did he commit suicide? What's that? Uh, hanging, he hung himself. himself. Yeah, hanging. Yeah. So he drugs suggested. and mental illness, basically. So I was really shocked when um um oh geez, man, I, it's pretty bad. You can remember their screen character's name, Mork from Mork. Um, Mork and Mindy. Yeah, Robin, Robin Williams. Robin Williams, thank Robin you. Williams. I'm getting old. That's what that's one of the first signs. Um, <laughs> Just smack him in the back of the head, Omar. Yeah. <laughs> That'll restart. Yeah, I, I was shocked by that one. He committed suicide because here's a funny man that's in front of every camera. He's all smiles and all chuckles and everything, but behind the scenes, man, he was going through some stuff. And Yeah, I think that might have something to do with it, right? Because Robin Williams was always on. And um, I think it's difficult. That's why, like, people always ask me. Like, I've had people tell me to act like a badass or something that that's gonna put it, push up my numbers. 
And I'm always telling people, listen, I'm just putting me out there. You know, I don't want to pretend to be something and then always have to be on because then that becomes a prison. Yeah. You know, so I always encourage people, if you're going to do this, just be yourself. We're not all the same. I think people like that, you know, be yourself and, and, and put, you know, put you out there so you don't feel trapped into having to do this thing. And then you right. feel like there's no way out. I know what I'm doing here is cathartic cathartic for me. You know, this is how I get out some of my frustrations by being creative. Um, even just shooting makes me feel better. Yeah. You know, I think it's good therapy. I think it's one of the reasons why everyone should feel better. But then huh? uh, I said shooting prairie dogs makes me feel better, but then I'm just not right in the head in many respects, but no, no, you're absolutely right. I love going out and shooting prairie dogs and pigs. I've become so addicted to that. It's so funny. It, but anyway, that's a whole other. Discussion. You're always hunting. When I, whenever I text you now, you're always. I know. I'm out in the bush. because these companies want to take me out and let me shoot things. And man, yeah. I mean, as a kid growing up, we hunted all the time. And then I went through this period where I was just too busy working and never really had the time. And now that I'm into the whole gun thing, I mean, hunting is the next step. You know, is, is just part of it. It's it's the next step. And man, being back into it's just addicting. We got rifles in Indiana finally. And, and this year I'm really looking forward to going out and shooting a deer. I used to go into other States to shoot deer. Now I get to shoot one in my home state with a rifle and it's just, yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, listen, shooting stuff makes me happy. Absolutely. I think it's good therapy. Okay. Listen, is there anything you guys want to plug before we go? I'm going to wrap this up. Anything you guys want to let people know about I'll out there? Omar. Go buy and check out coppercustom.com. Okay. That guy busted his rear end to get that done. Uh, I think it's the best looking gun store on the internet, man. Go by, check it out. Check out our filtering system and how we've organized everything. Okay. You just said plug Omar and busted his ass. I don't know. That's kind yeah, of Yankee weird. Marshall might have some fun with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to see if he was going to be embarrassed by that. <laughs> You're taking off. <laughs> he's out. He's like, oh, that's it. <laughs> I'm out of here. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And you guys, I think you just put up a video. Didn't you just put up a video? Was it yesterday or today? The Steyer Aug thing? I did that today. The Steyer Aug. Uh, yeah, the STG. I didn't bring it out. I should have brought that one. Uh, yeah, the STG 77, the 40th anniversary. It was kind of a, uh, uh, you know, oh, I was really? like all excited because it was going to be, you know, because the prices of pre band uh, AUGs is through the roof, right? I yeah. thought, aha, suckers, you guys got these rifles you think are worth so much money. I can go buy a brand new one for $1,800. And uh, yeah, it's. Uh, uh -oh. Got some it's, issues with it? It had a few issues. I mean, the quality is just okay. You have to watch the video. Um, yeah. You know, one magazine, an owner's manual that doesn't even address the optic that it has. Uh, it, it was just kind of a, wah, wah, I'll keep it. It's a neat gun. Only 400 of them are supposedly being made, although I don't think they're numbered. No, actually, I think it is numbered, but um, yeah, whatever. It was, I, I was more excited about it in thought than in actual application. Actually getting hands on it, I was kind of kind of like, ah, oh, well. Okay, cool. So definitely go out there and watch that. And then do you want to, I know you were talking about what you're doing with the NRA and how the, the, the money is going to a good cause. You want to plug that one more time? Yeah. So if you guys would uh, swing by and join the NRA, you can do it from pretty much any one of my videos in the description below. That link money does come back to me, but every single cent of that money gets donated to Hero Hunt, and they are a nonprofit organization that takes out wounded warriors and first responders, which include you know fire, police, EMT. Um, it's a very inclusive group, and they get them out, get them hunting, get them in the field, get them interacting with people of, of, of similar mindset, and, and it's helped them. Uh, if you guys went to the NRA show, you'll know that they were there, and one of their folks. Uh, Jose stood up and said that uh, Hero Hunt saved his life. He was a multi-tour um, Iraq war veteran and he was at the brink and he found Hero Hunt. He now works for them full time and Hero Hunt in his own words at, at our uh, YouTube gathering there said that uh, they had saved his life. So yeah, I give all the money that NRA gives to me straight to them because I can't profit from, from my activism. So please, if you don't want to join the NRA, share that link, guys, because again, all you're doing is helping to fund a nonprofit organization that actually helps not just wounded warriors and veterans, but also the first responders. Absolutely. And, and, and I just want to add to that, you know, um, we're all like family here. So when it comes to the NRA, we might complain about them a little bit, but we do need to support them. They're the biggest organization that's, that's out there fighting for our rights. So if there's things that we want to change, as, as Max said earlier, we just need, you know, we're in there trying to make changes, right?
Right. Give them so, four years, guys. Let's let's give them the four years. They're under new leadership. Let's give them a chance. Join. It's just a few bucks a year. Join. Get get in the fight because if we squander this opportunity that we have right now, it'll we'll have nobody to blame but ourselves. We have a friendly White House, House and Senate. And I have never seen this perfect storm and then a brand new leadership in the NRA that's going to fight the fight to get suppressors off the registry, get a national reciprocity and all that good stuff. It's now or never, guys. Stop fighting. Join the NRA. Give them four years. And if they don't do what they promise, then stop. I will. Yeah, so. absolutely. Thanks for that. Okay, so I'm going to I'm gonna uh, thank everyone that helps us to be able to put on this show, Rand CLP. Uh, Andrews Customs, Safety Harbor Firearms, and of course, Big Daddy Guns that actually provides the studio here. I want to thank those guys. And also, I want to thank everyone that supports us on Patreon. Uh, we are Patreon slash Hank Strange. And, and I know Mac also has a Patreon. So I am laughing at a comment. Somebody hashtagged Omar gets plugged. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Omar's going to hate me now, man. He's like, that <laughs> no Hank Strange. <laughs> I couldn't yeah, let that one go, man. Patreon, guys, before we, we, we bug out of here, uh, mm -hmm. Patron is really a great way to cut out that corporate entity that, that really crushes content creators that don't even like us to begin with. YouTube would kick us off in a heartbeat if they thought they could, and they may find a way. Um, they've, they've, they've crushed us. Our monetization is down across the boards. Every single YouTuber I talk to, at best, I've heard 60%. At worst, I've heard 80 or more percent down in their earnings. Patron allows you to come, um, you know, and donate a buck or two. And every month, like we're doing freedom munitions giveaways on the on the military arms patron page. We're doing freedom munition giveaways, hundred bucks every month for freedom munition ammunition. Uh, we're we're doing you know all sorts of uh, original content. Hank, I know you do the same thing. I mean, right. uh, you you get to see behind the scenes. You get access, direct access to me. I answer every single message you send to me on Patreon, and it's a great way to directly support the content creators. And don't just to support me and to support Hank. Every channel you watch. Toss them a couple of bucks, scrap your YouTube Reb subscription because we don't see any of that money anyway, and donate directly to the content creators if you truly want to help them out because I think crowdfunding, some people call it e-begging and I, I don't consider it that. It's no more than uh, begging at the box office, right? Do you think it's the, the actors are begging when you pay 15 bucks to get in to see a movie? No, they're, they're working and they're getting paid for it. So it's just us going directly to our audience to say, hey guys, if you help out, we're going to give you something in return. You know, we even give you great deals at Copper Custom. We try to give everything back we can, and you're directly supporting that those content creators that uh, you know put everything out there for you guys and support more than one. Don't just support me. Absolutely. Going forward, I think the some of the biggest contributors to helping fight for our gun rights are going to be people like you, people like you, Hank. Um, you know, Twenty Two Plinkster. Uh, you know, all the YouTube guys. Uh, you know, the news, the, the the media, the mainstream media definitely isn't helping us uh, in any way. So I think it's up to us to, you know, try to educate, you know, fellow gun owners, the, the younger generations, the, the students who are coming out of high school being taught that guns are bad. You know, it's, it's going to be up to us to try to uh, help conserve our, uh, you know, conserve our rights. Yep. Yeah. Look awesome. at that. Go Omar. He needs his own yeah. show. Yeah. He's, he should get his own channel or something <laughs> like that, man. He's good to go. All right. I want to I want to thank Omar, of course, for coming on. And that was a great comment. And uh, Mac, I really want to thank you, man, not just for coming on, but having my back over all the years for getting out there. And I know like uh, the sacrifice that you make, you know, in terms of your family and other people that care about you to 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 make these videos. I want to thank you for that. And I want to let you know that um, I'm sure lots of people out there feel the same way. But I love you. No, thanks, man. It's mutual. You know, yeah. we got to support each other. We're all in this together. Let's uh, let's stop the infighting. Let's all come together as a community and let's kick some butt these next four years, right? Amen, and brother. Just in general, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Amen. And I'm going to end it there. Peace out. All right. Take care, guys.